dubbed incised escarpment ridge. <laughs> you know, that just rolls off the tongue. Come up a little bit. So it looks like we've touched down on a yeah. quite steep sedimented slope. There's my, uh, my altitude's hitting you now, huh? All right. Where there, it looks like there may be some tracks from rocks rolling down well, the hill, I mean, stones and so yeah. on. And so while the RV guys are getting orientated, it's good probably a good time to do some introductions. Um, my name is Diva Amon, and I'm a research fellow at the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, I usually work on chemosynthetic habitats, so everything from whale falls and uh, woodfalls to hydrothermal vents yeah. and cold seeps. And I'm also working a lot on human impacts okay. on so the I life in the deep sea so around the world. Kind of wander south at all and this is Chuck Messing. Kind of I'm at Nova there. Southeastern University Maybe. in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Here. My area of specialization is the crinoids, the sea south. lilies, and okay. feather stars. Um, but, but I've also uh, you, had a fair amount of experience of with deep sea yeah. hard substrate uh, communities, deep sea coral and sponge communities, and uh, assemblages like that. My name is uh, Mike White. I'm a physical scientist with NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, and you're mapping lead on this cruise. Okay, Nav. Where so I actually need to rectify. I just said we touched down at 220 meters, when in fact we have actually touched down at about 2,220 meters. That's a big difference. Okay. So today we're going to be um, Cheat a little east. exploring an area that we hope to compare with our dive tomorrow. Um, this is yeah, we, we can do that. That sounds good. an area where there are these very uh, wow. rugged promontory features extending from the West Florida escarpment. Yeah, they almost look like finger-like projections. Right. And we basically want to compare the communities and the geology um, of these areas between about 2,300 meters and 1,800 meters. And we want to, com and we want to compare the area today with the area we're going to see tomorrow, which will be the same depth, except in yeah, let's start there. Uh, the more northerly sound? site we'll be visiting yeah, tomorrow, um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty the finger-like projections yeah, like are much more reduced from the West Florida escarpment. So you end up with yeah. much more yeah. sheer vertical Ooh, walls. So we think there could be a difference in the types of habitats and the types of communities we Not see, but covered. that will be determined tomorrow when okay, we get a, a good luck at both these sites. The deployed position here. We are going to have a midwater portion on the dive today. Um, that will be the end of the dive. We're going to pull off the seafloor around 3.30 Eastern Standard Time okay. and go up into the water column to, to run a series of transects to explore the least oh, known ecosystem right bottom, on our planet. Yeah, that's fine. You can adjust. And today, during okay. the benthic portion of the dive, we're hoping to collect a couple of rocks so that we can characterize the geology of, that area, of this area quite well, we go, uh, as well as um, yeah. Maybe some new or rare yeah, or cool interesting that animals uh, that the are inhabiting these hopefully in exposed hard substrate areas. I'm ready. One thing is interesting, Diva, about this area. Yeah. Here we are on a rather steep slope. It looks like it's a, oh, a good 45 degrees. All right, what do you there got? are a series of... Go ahead. Uh, Valley, downslope valleys, it looks like. Here's a downslope valley with a groove at the bottom that may be uh, a uh, channel for uh, rocks and uh, debris to s come down the slope. And despite the steepness of the slope, mm. we still have mostly sediment, okay. or all sediment That's as far great. as I can see here. Uh, so it's not so steep that the sediment under its own weight moves down the slope. Yeah, I'm really, really surprised to find this here. I honestly thought this was going to be all rock, given how steep the slope is. Watch the pilot. Go ahead, pilot. Okay, the front row is all ready. We are settled. I have Z-bias in, and we're ready to uh, start moving. Um, so if you guys see anything in the immediate area, let me know. 
Great, thank you. And we just want to continue upslope to our next waypoint. And yes, of course, we'll be seeing lots of interesting stuff, hopefully, that we'd like to zoom in. Copy that. I guess this is a good time to do introductions in the front row, too. Go for it. Uh, oh, gotcha. Latch, okay, X. Latch. Okay, in the front row here, we have, uh, and in the clipping chair, we have engineers for the working for the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration, or GFOE. My name is Chris Ritter, and I am piloting. And to my left is Fernando Aragon, sitting as navigator. And a co-pilot. Uh, sitting to the pilot's right, uh, I'm Levi Unima, sitting as co-pilot. In the far corner, you got Roland Bryan as video engineer. And in the way back, as video clipper, I'm Emily Nero. A pilot, would it be possible as uh, to move a bit uh, port because uh, we had that valley to our port with the groove at the bottom and then the slope was like another uh, uh, ridge that rose up and um, it looked very steep. I'd like to see if that might have, if we could go up there, maybe it's just going to be the same thing. But Bridge yeah, we're passing south. over it now and to uh, head up Go ahead, a little bit uh, forward and starboard, uh, forward and port, sorry, um, to see if the uh, crest of that ridge has uh, perhaps hard substrate that the one that we were on did not. I'm not sure it will, Super but um, might want to take a look. And Copy it's bridge. interesting, you can see in the... Um, in the groove in the valley, there's coarser material that's uh, uh, been funneled down from above. There's uh, on the sediment surface, you can see a lot of bioturbation, uh, low uh, craters, and um, there's a shrimp. There was a shrimp off left. Um, we've seen those before. Um, so we're probably better off gr going up the crest of one of these sediment ridges than up the groove between them. Copy that. So our move is at 125, I believe. So we are uh, only limited by that. I can go back and forth and Sirius' the screen as much as we want. Um, but I'll pick one of these crests, as you say, and I think it'll have to be the one to the right. Um, All right. As we proceed, but then since we're heading this way, uh, we can move to the other one. Roger uh, that. Just once we get a little bit more leash. Copy. Actually, we can stay over here. Watch. I'll, I'll stay to the to the left side as much as we can here. I actually stopped. Yes, yeah, so I'm not so sure if it's going to make any difference. Start again at one three zero. Uh, but uh, there is a whip. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, we see a whip over there. I think it's an umbelula, which is a type of penatulid. Uh, well, I'm not sure. Um, it could also be a um, uh, a bamboo coral Bridge with a fed star clinging to it. They all look alike from this distance. <coughs> and that is looking more like a stalked crinoid. Maybe. Nope, I'm sticking with my original. Umbelula. You are. Yep. They look for input. very similar. Sorry, Sorry. I had the phone in my hand. Ah, uh, no problem. Seems like we've lost phone communications. Yep. Diva scores again. Copy. It's the youthful eyes. This is, uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> so this is a C pen. It's an unusual C pen. It's the, actually the first C pen we've seen. Um, there are two species in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm not sure how you distinguish them. And uh, whereas most sea pens have their polyps, this is an octocoral. It's one of the um, three major groups under octocoralia. And you can see each of those polyps has eight tentacles, and each tentacle has little side branches. And all of that is characteristic of octocorals, which include both the, the soft corals, the gorgonians, 
sea uh, whips, many of the sea whips and sea pens. Um, but most sea pens have their polyps in uh, along branches along much of the stalk. And Umbalula is unusual in having its polyps concentrated at the very top of the stalk. And there looks like, is that a, can we zoom in on that little crustacean? See what that is, some kind of, uh, is that a regular shrimp? Now that's not an, a regular shrimp. That looks like it could be a, either maybe a leptostracan or a mycid because it does not have uh, abdominal appendages. It's swimming with the exopods of its uh, thoracic appendages and it looks like it has a, um, an, um, a brood pouch with dark red eggs in it. So my, my initial um, guess is uh, a mycid mm -hmm. shrimp. Yeah, I Very agree. cool. Because mycids are known to be brooders, aren't they? Yes, they are. They are brooders. They are in the same major group of crustaceans as the isopods, uh, the pill bugs, side. the Can't amphipods, but just let you know and a are. few others. Understood. And they all have this brood pouch yeah, under their I thorax. Can here. Yeah, I can. That's a beautiful little mycid. Yeah. And an amazing shot. Yes. Video's clear. Copy. Look okay, at let's come wide video. So this is a reminder that the site we're exploring today has never been explored before. Um, in fact, there haven't been many dives even remotely close to here. So whatever we're seeing is going to be brand new to us as well as everyone watching. And it's going to be really important for um, understanding a little bit more about this area of the West Florida escarpment. Fast guy, huh? Yeah, quick. So circle on the right, bottom right. Maybe it's just an extenuation of that. Uh, There's a crater. Crevice. Oh, the that set of yeah. set of those, yeah. Five black dots. There you and you can see the discoloration of the sediment here. That is all organic detritus that has drifted down from the surface see waters um, and discolored yeah, the paler about, sediment um, underneath and the Arvinab small Bridge, burrowing Bridge, organisms Bridge. that dig yeah. up sediment, the I cleaner sediment finished. from below. Video you kind can of cool see their, uh, view right now. You can see the sediment their, uh, rolling down the hill. Little mounds yeah. uh, of pale sediment that they generate. Conference call has been reestablished. You Thank can zoom back out. Thanks, video. Um, so we should be back on the conference call now. Uh, we uh, got disconnected. Back. Great. Not much current down here. No. Pretty benign. See some holes up there. Yeah, I'm just gonna head over there. So now that we've established that there actually are sea pens in the Gulf of Mexico, I would also say be on the lookout for small bushy colonies so in the uh, bushy thing sediment. in that hole. Those would be a canella family. Which which one? Coming center. center. Sometimes they're a little bit hard to see. It can be fairly small. Uh, we'll look for them. Um, as uh, Scott mentioned, yeah. the smaller sea pens scene? are frequently hole. difficult to see, and the sometimes the the, best, the easiest thing is to pick out their shadow from uh, the yeah, ROV's yeah. lights. Optical illusion. 
Video coming in serious. So if you have a look at the Sirius cam, which is screen two um, or camera two, you can actually see that D2 has just created a, a miniature avalanche and there's a sediment plume moving down the very steep slope. Doesn't take much, does it? Just a little touch. Yeah, it's just from, just from sitting down for zooms. Yeah. Uh, okay, co-pilot, the ship has been stopped for about three minutes. Can Do I you want another move in? Uh, yeah. Yes. Something left in serious view. Uh, Mod. I see that. Uh, do you want one two zero, one two five? One two zero, I like it. Okay. Yeah, one two zero. Twenty meters at point two coming up. And there's a great sea cucumber. That one actually is also Partial able to on swim. Serious. And right I know now. the name of that. That is. Uh, yeah, there it is. That's it. And that is Benthothuria funebris. That's good copy. I've got two zero meters bearing one, two, zero speed decimal two. Is that correct? Yeah, and I'm not sure copy if it's the same species, but we, these uh, Holothurians that look like this, these purple, very spiky, um, condensed uh, morphologies, do tend to be found, you know, as far south as, for instance, the southern Caribbean. Um, and a lot of animals, deep sea animals, do actually overlap between those areas um, because of the currents that transport these animals from the Southern Caribbean up into the Gulf of Mexico, actually populating a lot of it. So, magnificent. so this animal would actually be a deposit feeder. So its mouth is on the underside of its body, um, on the interface with the sediment. And it will walk along the sediment, um, eating as it goes, um, and excrete out or ingest out, poop out the sediment, which is inedible, and keeping what, of course, is. And uh, it's, it's rather difficult for the uninitiated to realize why an animal like this should be in the same major group as the uh, five-sided sea stars, brittle stars, and sea urchins, because you don't see any five-sided symmetry here. But imagine if you took a sea urchin and stretched it out, Compression. softened it, and laid it on, over on its side and you and get, took away its shell, and you'd have the Ooh, basic makings Trend. of a sea cucumber. This one is, a, in, in this case, the tube feet, and there he floats away. These are almost neutrally buoyant. Uh, okay. uh, it got disturbed a little by the ROV's bow wave. But uh, uh, basically, a sea urchin, if you look at a, a live sea urchin, it has five sections sort of arranged like lines of longitude around its shell so of spines and uh, tube feet. So if you stretched one out from the upper end to the uh, lower end with the mouth, and so instead of looking like a tomato upside down, it looked more like a, a cucumber uh, and or a, uh, a salami. Top, right? and uh, okay. lay it over on its side, you'd have a spoke. salami with five rows of tube feet. And in the case of many of these sea cucumbers, two of those rows of tube feet have become warts or papillae, and the other three rows down on the underside remain uh, as the, uh, as the uh, suckered tube feet that they walk along. And in that particular case, the mouth was turned down against the sediment. So they are anatomically and developmentally very similar to sea, to sea yeah, urchins and, uh, and the other echinoderms. As a matter of fact, sea urchins are their closest rel okay. relatives among the echinoderms. And they're actually pretty um, difficult to identify while you can 
you know, superficially identify them from the way they look, you know, how many projections they have, colors, size, shape, that kind of thing. Um, you actually need to use, lose, use internal um, diagnostic features to identify them really accurately to species. Nope. And so those are called ossicles. One. And they are almost the tiny little skeletal wheels within the um, sea cucumber's body. So yeah, you need to do some microscope so work. And of yeah. course, as usual, Teetering. as with taxonomy now, we do tend to do DNA work to complement that morphological work. All right, we now have Bridge. Go ahead, Bridge. Yeah, position move is complete. Copy that. Ship just there are some uh, radiating um, features uh, associated with burrowing organisms that may have been something like an echiurine worm, a spoon worm, um, which has a long proboscis with cilia that it will send out in all directions from its burrow. Unfortunately, unfortunately we didn't see one. Okay, let's go ahead. So this is another sea cucumber, a really bizarre one. It's got, uh, it, it has adhered to itself all of these little triangular sea butterfly shells that have fallen down from the upper waters. And this one was named after a fellow named Olaflin. So the genus name is Olaflinius. That's a mouthful to pronounce. These little triangular shells belong to a kind of gastropod. The gastropods are the snails and cowries and whelks and conchs. But these shells, these, these particular gastropods, uh, are planktonic. Their shell is very thin, so it's uh, of less weight. Place. And their foot, instead of used in crawling, okay, instead of being used in crawling, is wide. broadened as two wing-like flaps. And so these are called sea butterflies. And here you can see the uh, rather random undulating trail that the sea cucumber is left behind as it plows through that uh, surface layer of organic detritus and uh, just continual smorgasbord of... Uh, of food. So I'm just reading a paper by Dave Pawson, who is one of the experts on sea cucumbers, especially in the Gulf of Mexico. And he said that the cover of the Possibly of the species the of sea right cucumber of usually consists of sponge spicules or foraminiferans. Oh, yes, yeah. um, but sometimes, like in this case, they do cover themselves with pteropod shells, probably from the genus Cleo. And I'm not quite sure they know why they do this. Perhaps protection against predation? You know, having that crunchy yeah, exterior may here. not be so appetizing? Well, that makes perfect sense, certainly. And here is a what looks like a very juvenile burrowing anemone, tube-dwelling anemone. It makes perfect sense. Certainly it's not okay, camouflage on. in the visual sense because there's no light that. down here. I think we're good. But Got if it. a wandering predatory sea star or crustacean came along, the first thing they would feel in the dark were these little dead shells and might bypass the uh, sea cucumber thinking that it was not alive and not worth uh, uh, considering for a meal. Uh, the general technical term for uh, the sea butterflies, by the way, is pteropod, with a silent P at the beginning, meaning wing foot. All right, Although pilot, ready even for your more technically, move? they belong to a group of yes, gastropods called so. the thecosomes, okay, which means shell body. Uh, yeah. 
Yep. Bridge, there's an F. Go ahead, an F. Uh, Scott France uh, suggests that uh, that uh, anemone we just saw might be an Edwardsiid, which is not a tube-dwelling anemone. It's a regular sea anemone, uh, but it is a burrower, and that's uh, certainly possible. And there is Ipnops murrayi with its bizarre flat modified eyes or ocular structures, hardly call them eyes anymore, lying on the bottom. And so these are actually in the same family as the tripod fish that we've been seeing from the family Ipnoptidae. Should turn on the lasers. You got lasers. Copy lasers. And for those of you who have uh, tuned in for the first time on our expedition, the two laser dots are uh, parallel lasers aboard the ROV so that whatever distance we are from the bottom, they are always the same distance apart, which is 10 centimeters. And just to continue on that, if this is your first time tuning in, we are on the Okeanos Explorer. And until December 20th, we will be diving every day in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, currently, we're located off the west coast of Florida, but we'll be moving all the way diving along um, the shelf as we go uh, to the west Gulf of Mexico. And this is the first of three cruises within the Gulf of Mexico. The next one it will be an in a cruise dedicated entirely to mapping. And then after that, in April, there's going to be another ROV cruise, again, working its way across the entire Gulf of Mexico. And during these two ROV cruises, we expect to dive at you know, incredible sites like um, ridges, canyons, uh, chemosynthetic habitats, such as cold seeps, brine pools, mud volcanoes, and even probably a few shipwrecks. So this is actually a really nice change because for the last three years, the Okeanos Explorer has been in the, Gulf, in the Pacific Ocean, exploring um, many of the American monuments, um, as well as a couple other areas as part of their capstone program. So for this season, the 2017 to 2018 season, they are actually gonna be back in the Gulf of Mexico and the eastern seaboard of the U.S. doing dives and exploration there. Actually, we're just going to do a quick pilot change. Sure thing. How about giving us uh, one uh, side to side to see how steep the slope is? Yeah, absolutely. Can we have a quick zoom at the end of that trail? There looks like there's a little globby animal, potentially a sea Bottom cucumber. Bottom right of the trail. Exactly. Yeah. Name it Charlie. Come in. Sorry, I was floating up a little bit, coming down. That does look like a, uh, it might be a sea cucumber, but a pretty nondescript one. Uh, there's one of those radiating burrows. And that might be the same thing, but instead of being covered with pteropods, it's covered mostly with uh, perhaps sediment or not covered with much at all. I'm not sure what they look like. Yeah, so all of these that cover themselves fall into the family Cynelactidae. So this does look a little bit more like perhaps the genus Molpodiodemus. Very yeah. good. Um, but it, as Chuck said, it could very well be the same species we just saw, but not quite at the decorative stage that 
the last one was. But I like your uh, we be identification to the better. Any second. So it's called uh, Pedio de Dima. So something down it's a mouthful. Kind of like a star shape. Yeah, at some point we'll see one of those with the. Uh, oh, and there's or another um, yes, Acuran burrow. All right. So what the animal does is it lives within the sediment, um, and it's actually known as a spoonworm colloquially, and it then sends out this feeding process, which it drags along the sediment. Um, to bring food into its burrow. And so as you can see, it's worked its way around the burrow in a um, circular fashion, leaving what almost looks like bicycle spokes. Video's clear. All right, pilot's clear. We're good for another one, uh, Nev, whatever you... Yeah. Okay, another... Do you want to do 20 or 30 meters this time? Let's do 30. Okay. 30 meters, one, two, zero. Copy that. Coming up. Go ahead, Nav. Good copy. We relay that back. I've got three zero meters bearing one Stop. two zero speed yeah. decimal two. Is that correct? That is yeah. correct, right? So, of course, can we get a zoom on this, please? Yes. I'm going to put it between the skids. Like As we zoom in here, uh, uh, Bob Carney reports that um, the uh, sea cucumbers that cover themselves that we saw earlier would, were put in uh, a genus called um, Pseudostichus by Elizabeth Dykeman, who was one of the queens of uh, sea cucumber ta uh, taxonomy and ox actually octocoral taxonomy at the early part of the se 20th century. But uh, Bob is not sure that the new genera is of uh, really much more useful uh, because they don't have any spicules, as it turns out. So this is a bamboo coral, another octocoral. I'm up and some this sediment. looks it's like one that has the nodes quick. at very long intervals. I don't see any uh, offhand. Um, yeah, I just see one there, Chuck. I'm yeah. wondering... Um, if we can get all the way to the base here, this may be actually um, uh, representative of the true type species of the genus Lepidisis, hmm. which when it was first discovered is anchored in the mud with roots instead of on something hard. And another thing I'm looking at is how tall and slender those polyps are. That's also consistent with, uh, it would be Lepidisis caryophilia. Excellent. And, yeah, you notice that's disappearing into the sediment. So I'll bet that has a root-like structure, kind of like a tree, rather than the disc-like holdfast. When we're on rock, you can see this small disc at the base that is kind of glued to a rock. But uh, somehow, yes. probably the larvae are settling on thing? maybe one of these terrapod yeah, shells or something very small and hard. But then as they grow, to... kind of like the calcium carbonate that I gets deposited, try, try drips to kind of like wax into the sediment. Video, yeah, special video root. filters. Um, so I'll bet that uh, Lepidisis maybe even Caryophilia, which would be very cool. Some kind of fish or holothurian or something. To and up until this cruise, I actually screen. didn't yeah. know that yes. corals had root structures Long and tail, could you know, live in soft sediment like this. I always thought they had to have that anchoring okay, um, base that attaches them to hard substrate. So this is a halosaur. Lasers are clear. Perhaps cool. Aldrovandia. Yeah, uh, three or four Excellent. species are known to do it. Thanks, Scott. Learn things every day. Did I say that uh, Elizabeth Dykeman was the king of... Uh, I should I have said queen. So. Uh, Rob, Bob Carney is... Uh, queen. I did yeah, say you queen. Did say Thank queen. you. <laughs> and the genus was actually Pseudostichopus, not Pseudostichus. Um, that was a typo, I think. But there are lots of um, genera within that family that do cover themselves. And I mean, there must be some distinguishing feature that taxonomists Wrong. use, despite them not having um, ossicles, or perhaps they just okay. go off of the um, molecular uh, barcode they end up getting from the DNA of the animal on. to uh, distinguish these, these genera from each other. So that was um, perhaps Aldrovandia, but I know there is another halosaur genus in the area, 
and you distinguish them based on whether they have scaling on the top no, of their head? Anything. That's beyond me. They just came up. And there's another, uh, um, looks like another bamboo coral. Gives you an idea for how steep it is here. And a small shrimp scudding by. Well, look, can we get a quick zoom in on this? Yeah. Not the necessarily we the whole have thing about this time. Five meter left on quick that zoom. Move. You're Video. full wide. Got yeah, the polyps aren't as obvious on. here. I think they want the full screen view. They want a close. Yeah, up. and I was noted before there are three or four species right. known to root. There's also one in the family Chrysogorgiidae, which is a whip uh, in the genus Radicipes, which There's is also polyps. capable of rooting in sediments. So it's a good idea to have a, a look here. Yeah, this one has a lot more of the nodes, and the nodes look like they are little uh, knobby features. So and I don't yeah, see I any polyps. This is a dead colony, so you can see the skeleton much more clearly. Uh, I see. Yeah, okay, so it provides thanks. a really good contrast with the last one we were looking at. Because the soft tissue is missing off of this one, we are getting a really good look at the skeleton. And so you can distinctly see that no those nodes. All right, we now bridge. Ship is finished position. Great. Thank you, pilots. Yeah. Copy bridge, thank you. And this is, um, so we, we started out on one of these, uh, you might call them whaleback slopes of sediment with that groove in between. And we've moved over to the the one on the port side, and you can just about make out another uh, groove or valley uh, to beyond us to Got the me. left, and another ridge beyond that. So it looks like there's a series of these uh, whaleback um, sediment-covered slopes separated by grooves that uh, coarser sediment and rocks can run down. How much you got left in that move? Uh, we're stopped right now. Okay. Uh, Sirius might be swinging a little bit, but not much. D ten four. And so it looks like we're approaching our first bit of hard substrate. We are moving up into a much steeper section of the slope, so that would make sense in this area. The sediment all, all um, can't accumulate because there isn't enough of a ledge for it to do that, and so it constantly will tumble down the hill. And as a result, we're able to see these exposed features. And this again will be limestone, um, millions of years old. Video, can we snap? That has eroded white out of the uh, surface, and there's a small glass sponge. You guys need a close-up of this, or? The two of them. The lower one looks like uh, Euplectella, and the upper one. Not sure. If you look at the Sirius uh, camera, you can see these low limestone ledges tilting down slope. And uh, there's a large chunk that is broken off. And the uh, there's a uh, groove between um, 
two of these areas of uh, downward tilting pavement, really you could call them pavements, um, and that represents a channel uh, that's been eroded by sediment pouring down from above. And some of the little burrows uh, that have managed, some of the organisms that have managed to burrow into probably little crevices in the limestone and excavate sediment, you can see these long trails of sediment pouring down the, uh, or running down the um, face of this limestone, tilted limestone pavement. This limestone is heavily eroded and, and bored, pro excavated, probably by um, sponges and other organisms, but millions of years ago. This is another glass sponge. Video, you can frame it up real quick. Probably Euplectella, or in at least in the family Euplectellidae. It's got little hairs. And on, beyond it may be a. You uh, yes, Regadrella may be this genus. Could we get lasers back on? Thanks. Lasers back. All right, video. We would refer to on. this kind of limestone, um, or it can, this sure kind of here. limestone can be referred to as karstic. That's K-A-R-S-T-I-C, uh, meaning it's highly eroded yeah, and fenestrated, penetrated yeah, with all meters? kinds of burrows sure. yeah. and holes and cavities yeah. and so on. And, and karstic limestone can take uh, a variety of scales. So Coming the uh, freshwater caves in central and northern enough. Florida are representative of a, a karstic limestone as well on a much grander scale. Copy and read that back to you. We've got two zero meters. Video one, two zero white, speed, uh, decimal two. Is that correct? That is correct, Bridge. Copy, stand by, friend. And here, that white, um, there's another little, uh, that looks like a juvenile um, Afrocalistes, perhaps. A very small one with those lobes. This is another glass sponge. Right, we're not and you can really see how uh, one, two, zero, flocculent speed, this two. tan, pale brown uh, organic detritus is that has come down from the uh, upper waters that mostly consists probably of uh, dead phytoplankton and maybe fecal material, all sorts of detritus. That long white streak on the right side is probably sediment that may be sediment that has been Frame dug up, up uh, white by a burrower who found a little hole in the limestone and excavated it. And the sediment pours down the slope. Um, I swear but these white, white the, lines I can't quite tell. What it's do you hard. think? It also almost looks hard. Or is it where it's it scraped doesn't look clean. like sediment? Maybe it's where the... Or perhaps it could just be like a area that's slumped, a tiny area that's slumped yep. down the hill. Yep. Yeah. That isn't covered with... Um, uh, the phytodetritus. Interesting. Okay, video, come on. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's filled with sediment. Maybe, I don't know. This kind of outcropping, these low uh, downslope tilted highly eroded pavements are very different. We've seen some highly eroded uh, limestone like this before on some of our other dives, but this arrangement where you just have these low pavements tilted downslope and largely covered with sediment is new. And exploring these types of geological features is really important um, in helping us to understand the geological composition as well as the origin of this area of the Florida Escarpment. And as a result, we have quite a couple of geologists um, 
on the chat. So why don't we take a second? Who is on the phone? Would you like to introduce yourselves? Hi, here's uh, Bill Keeney. Um, I'm a regional scientist for Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and I'm based in uh, Galveston, Texas. Come up a bit with you. Hello, I'm uh, Scott Harris, the biologist at University. Hey Scott, we're losing you. Um, could you about five meters left perhaps that move moment. closer to the mic? We can't Copy really that. hear. I can't get closer to the mic because my lips are almost touching it. <laughs> okay, is that better? That sounds much better. Any better? Okay, I haven't done anything different. Uh, this is Scott France. I'm in the Department of Biology at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. And I am interested in deep sea biodiversity and octocorals in particular. Yeah, it's snap. I think this is a shrimp, but uh, verify here. Confirm. And we do have, as well as those two scientists that you just heard from, um, a range of scientists from across the U.S. and, uh, and elsewhere in the world joining us today. Um, I see Adam Skarkey, Amanda Netburn, uh, Craig McLean, Deborah Glickson, Kevin Redemacher, Tracy Sutton, Kimberly Galvez, Sandra Brooke. Um, and this is one of the best things about the Okeanos Explorer and using telepresence to explore. While there are just two Talk scientists left. on board, Charles, uh, Charles Messing Part and I, now. we are actually able to tap into a much wider base of expertise and so that means that you know we can almost tailor it uh, to what we may need on a particular dive for instance today we're expecting to see a lot of corals and sponges as well as um, a lot of great geology and so that will probably make up the major complement um, of scientists on this dive whereas in a couple of days we're going to be diving on a shipwreck and so our um, scientists are probably going to change to a lot of archaeologists so we do video, thank all of up. these scientists for joining us. Stuff, um, yeah. Without you, we wouldn't be able to sound quite as knowledgeable as we do. <laughs> and here's another of the uh, whip-like bamboo corals and a beautiful red mycid shrimp hanging about. We saw one on an umbellula sea pen earlier, so maybe they are not particularly uh, particular about who they hang out with. Any old octocoral in a storm. This is, that shrimp is magnificent. You can see it using what are the exopods, the outer branches of its thoracic appendages that are feathery. Impressed with the and it's using slides. them to swim yeah. because unlike true shrimp, it has no abdominal appendages. You see that long tail that's missing any little swimmerettes. And underneath it, it has, uh, again, it looks like it, this is a gravid female that has its pouch filled with eggs it or perhaps um, larvae, post larvae. So now that I'm locked. Uh, season, Chuck. I mean, if yes. I could also point out on the bamboo coral behind. Uh -huh. polyps, Coffee break. Notes that some of them Ship are bent stopped. about halfway. Oh, maybe I'm talking too late. You've already pulled away. I mean, uh, no. But they're Keep bent going, though. halfway, and the reason is in this species, Lepidisis caryophylla, they have long needle-like sclerites in basically two rows. So one near the base, and then another one starting about halfway up to the tentacles. And so they can kind of bend or articulate between where those needles are. And I assume that... Um helps when the current direction changes. I imagine you're right. Uh, the other thing you can see is that the tissue on the skeleton itself is extremely thin. So unlike many of the other octocorals we see, these cannot retract into any flesh or pull their uh, bodies down also because of those needles. So the only thing they can really do is fold over. Thanks very much, Scott. And here on the bottom, you can see there are more numerous little mounds, 
suggesting that there's a, uh, a greater population density, uh, we perhaps of in fauna, the, of the organisms of in the sediment, plant for us as far as time than there were when we uh, first hit bottom, touched touch okay. down. And there are a couple of larger mounds meters? coming up, yeah. and uh, some more yeah. of those radiating so. burrow features. Yes, and our looks pretty good. Does uh, contour suggest it does get steeper? Yeah. Oh, but yeah. Bridge to the nav. Alex, go ahead now. Copy. I missed it, but several minutes ago, uh, Tracy Sutton remarked Hi, that uh, go for floating subject. one yeah, of the uh, bristlemouth drifted zero by a cyclothony. Is this is a Copy larvacean again. La I don't see the uh, tenant, so this may be a discarded house. But larvaceans are related to the sea squirts. They're called oh, larvaceans like because the adult looks like the larva of a sea squirt. And they build these houses out of mucus, and the uh, delicate white part in the interior the uh, were these now. filters three zero three zero that three these uh, organisms use to collect extremely small particles out of the plankton. As a matter of fact, when they were first discovered a century ago, okay. uh, rather when they were first studied about a century ago in detail, uh, Hans Lohmann uh, made the discovery that these larval houses, these larvacean houses, collected plankton that was smaller than anybody had seen before because the nets used at the time were too coarse. And this opened up an entire world of what's called nanoplankton, including bacteria and photosynthetic bacteria, and c generated uh, information about an entirely new. Uh, com major component of ocean food webs. And when those larvacean houses are clogged up with material, uh, the larvacean bails out, builds a new house, and the old house with its accumulated detritus sinks to the sea floor and uh, contributes to the nutrition of organisms on the, sea flo on the deep sea floor. And the uh, little cluster of uh, knobs that we just passed over, uh, Amanda and uh, Amanda Demopoulos and Bob Carney uh, confirmed that it was a xenophyophore, which is a uh, bizarre creature. It's a single cell, even though it's obviously quite large. It's a foraminiferan, and in some places they can be enormously abundant on the deep sea floor, accumulating, covering their protoplasm with um, fine mud and detritus. Another stock coming up center, yeah. to the right, 10 to 4. Pilot, just right of center is a small stalk, if we could zoom in on that. Absolutely. Scott, take a look. This is, we'll see whether this is a... Um, maybe you can frame it up as I approach. Another bamboo coral, a small one, or maybe one of your Chrysogorgiids or a sea pen. Okay, it looks in. like it has, well, the, the polyps are extended, but they're uh, almost transparent. The brown looks like it might be a worm tube running along the stalk. And it, I can see one node in there and the little pink mouths. So this looks like a bamboo coral that we've seen before. And there's a little yep. hermit Seven crab. Checks. It's a little bit invisible there for a while. It really, uh, it's really hard to see against the sediment until you get really close. Right, and there's a tiny little hermit crab. A crab at base. Say again? Oh, I just said the same thing you did. It looked like a little hermit crab at the base. Yes, but interestingly, that hermit crab is so small, it looks like it may be in a pteropod shell. Can't quite tell. 
but they've got to start out somewhere. Take advantage of what's available. Thank you, pilot. Thank you, video. No problem. There's another one of those uh, shrimps that we've seen quite commonly, probably nematocarcinus, with its very long legs and antennae. They're quite uh, consistent on our dives here. Should we get another ship move in now? We haven't finished the last one. The last one was okay. 30 meters, and we still have um, about 5 meters yeah, to go. Yeah, let's snap right. on Copy. here real quick. Let's see what this is. Let's see if I need to stop. I'll get another 30 meter right after this one. And that's a good eye, pilot. Copy. Another okay. one. Good. This one looks let's dead. This is dead, okay. and it's got some, uh, there's a little feather star on it. Uh, actually, the lower part is alive, and there's another little hermit crab at the base, maybe sheltering. We'll get closer. Up the stalk, though, it looked um, dead. Uh, there was a feather star attached, clinging, and also, um, I believe, a, if we can get up a little higher, yeah. there's another little mycid shrimp drifting by, and those are gooseneck barnacles uh, sticking out uh, near the top. We're looking at them end on, so they're quite narrow. And that brown might be a uh, polychaete tube. Zoom? I can't quite make it out. It looks like it might be. Chuck, you know that? Say again. Chuck, that previous colony that we saw, yeah, just, we I thought maybe about. there was a piece of sargassum wrapped around it. And I wonder if um, sargassum routinely kind of gets wrapped around these colonies and abrades the, the tissue, back, uh, killing some there, of the, one, the two, tissue, and that exposes that the skeleton, then allows things like barnacles barnacle. and polychaetes to uh, get a hold of the skeleton, take over. That makes perfect sense. And above that brown tube is a what may be a post-larval crinoid with the first pinules developing, and the little... Bridge fuzzy brown tree-like structures are agglutinating foraminiferans. So here we have a, a whole community of organisms taking advantage of the, so the dead coral uh, axis. There you can see the cirri of the uppermost gooseneck barnacle spread out into the current, and its posture suggests that the current is coming directly towards us. So I just wanted to give a little bit of background um, on the dive. Thanks, video. Uh, this morning was a little bit more exciting than they usually are. Um, we pick our dive sites with the um, assistance of scientists and stakeholders ashore uh, the, at least the night before. Um, we'll narrow down a dive track, and that will get sent out in the dive report uh, to via email to all of the you know, hundreds of scientists who have registered to keep abreast with what's happening on the Okeanos Explorer. But unfortunately, we got to our dive site this morning and realized that it's in an area of high currents um, that we really weren't expecting at all. And to make matters worse, the currents were coming from the southwest, which was the opposite of what we were expecting, if any. So we had to very, very quickly um, have a quick meeting very early this morning it and decide sun, where else we should assist. dive. So we headed to a site further south. Um, this looks like a dead glass sponge stalk, by the way. But we headed to a site further south, um, which we were able to choose sponge based on the fact that it had a similar depth range to what we wanted, yeah. as well as um, a very steep slope. So our new site to the south will allow us to achieve the same goals which we wanted to hopefully satisfying a lot of the needs um, of the scientists and stakeholders ashore, as well as you know, allowing us to explore a really exciting habitat. So a little bit different from you what we had planned last night, but also quite similar. I'll see. 
What's the And now last we verdict? are coming in on a magnificent glass sponge. So you see the body of the sponge, which looks like a vase um, on top, and it produces this long stalk of glass fibers, silica fibers that penetrate into the substrate and anchor it. Five meters to go. And uh, it's up there like the, um, the polyps of the bamboo coral, suspension feeding, picking out particles from the seawater, although sponges Activity feed on much, will. much smaller particles than bamboo corals. And here along the stalk, we have a whole community Do you have any current? of gooseneck barnacles and brittle stars. Oh. Those brittle stars look like they are members of the Ophiocanthidae, very spiny. And gooseneck barnacles of all sizes here. Uh, and oh, also, you can see there are little polyps sticking out of the sponge body. Those are colonial anemones. Those off. are zoanthids. Sponges um, in many places and many habitats, including shallow waters and reefs, have uh, zoanthid associates. So sponges right feed on, on particles that are generally bacteria-sized or smaller, whereas some of these gooseneck barnacles feed on much, much larger particles, as do the brittle stars. And here you can see the large gooseneck barnacles. These are probably Arcoscalpellum, and they even have barnacles on the barnacles. So it's pretty extraordinary. You can see how much coarser the um, branch of the fine, they are fine branches on those dark cirri radiating from the barnacle but the different sizes of different barnacles will feed on different anchored, sized particles. And there is kind of a, through the sediment if to a harder could we substrate. hold on that little white fan yeah. for a moment, that looks like a bryozoan, a moss animal. And there looks like a couple of small bivalves attached around near the base of that, at least Bridge one of them near the base of that uh, Fan. Uh, are we holding position right now, or are we still in the move? Uh, no, we just finished the move, and yeah, yeah. sorry, I was making a security call. Continue and so that, this, thank you. you can see the individual fibers of the sponge's stalk made of silica, like a Go fiber ahead. optics. There's another little mycid shrimp, a feather duster mm -hmm. worm no. in the family Serpulidae. And here you see how the fibers penetrate into the sea floor much like the stalk of the uh, the base of the stalk of the um, the bamboo coral although an entirely different structure and those clusters that darker brown cluster just to the right looks like another xenophyophore this is an amazing community i mean extraordinary when you think that if you release a larva into the water you're off some place and you release a lot millions of larvae into the water what are the odds that any one of them will find a home in such a bar relatively Thanks barren again. environment, at least as far as suspension oh, right. is concerned? Right. But then looking at these barnacles, it's possible that the l large ones, I don't know enough about barnacle biology, but maybe the offspring of these large barnacles is extremely short-lived, and those are the offspring the little ones growing on the uh, stalk as well. I don't know enough about them to say whether they are all the same species or not. But that's a marvelous little assemblage. Thank you very much, pilot. Thank you, video. That's great. The genus name, I think, of the sponge is Hyalonema, which means glass thread. And interestingly, um, when I was on the Okeanos Explorer last year and we were exploring the Marianas, um, we collected a stalk sponge very similar to that one, um, except I think that one may have been Colophacus, which is another stalked sponge genus. And it was incredible because, you know, it appeared to be standing up in sediment, very similar to that one. And when we collected it and got it on board, it actually had this entire root structure, just like, that looked just like a tree. You know, if you pulled a young tree out of out of the dirt on land, you know, it's got this central root and then tapering down and it just, it was incredible how similar 
this animal was with something that was, you know, th from three kilometers up and in a completely different habitat. Really, really interesting. Video, can we snap on small white possible sphere? I don't know what this little guy is. I saw something else in frame two we could go find. And that looks like a little juvenile glass sponge. Don't know whether it will survive there or not. We'll let go video. Yeah, we'll go up to these guys. Bounce over here. I think I can reach it, Copilot. Yeah, I think so. That'll That'll be be I'll, I'll uh, turn here we're approaching... You, some other things can't tell what they are maybe these dead look, yeah these look like dead stocks i do see something upper left a little uphill from them uh, possible sponge yeah video you can frame up these another um this, this uh, uh, burrowing here. anemone a brittle star these are uh, look like dead uh, glass sponge stalks with brittle stars Go far right i guess on them this one has another kind of sponge near the base. Still and I'm not sure what those little white things are. Some of them are branching. Those I mean, could be zoanthids, video, long, skinny, polyp zoanthid anemones. As I settle in. At the uh, tip there. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that's all chewed up there. That's what I'm guessing. Those are some kind of polyps. Are those? Can't quite tell. Yeah. Well, I'm there's some octocoral polyps here. Those are octocoral polyps. Scott, any idea? I'll try to hold this you shot. You can also see a couple of amphipods scuttering around between. They've got this very distinct white um, head or... Perhaps they're carrying something. Can work our way down to the end of it, I guess. Sorry, I stepped away there, Chuck, for a moment. We're still on it. I think they're curious about the octo. The, yeah, uh, I'm having a look here. Those guys. You, uh, you max him. They Not look. Usual. They look yeah, like skinny soon. little bamboo coral branches, growing along this yeah, dead so sponge. Yeah. I think what this is is um, uh, the other day I was referring to something like a. Uh, Telestulo or Telestinid. Okay. They're similar to uh, the Stoloniferous octocorals, except they have a small, per a short perisarch. You know, the perisarch is that kind of exoskeleton like cuticle that you find so on the hydroid colony. Yes. So these octocorals form something like that. I that believe that's correct. what we're looking at. That's, for that's really neat. That's very cool. All right. So uh, octocorals can form all different kinds of the colonies. We've seen the soft here. corals, the red anthemastus or pseudoanthemastus um, before I'll that has the no spot. skeletal, no uh, rigid axis to support it. It's sort of a lump. And we have a lot of soft corals on the reefs, particularly in the Pacific. And then, of course, the various sea fans uh, sea whips, sea plumes, um, gorgonians that have a protein axis, the precious corals and bamboo corals that have solid calcareous axes, and uh, something like this stoloniferin okay, that has uh, runners with the polyp sticking up from it. And then there are other kinds as well. And here's a glass sponge. Similar to what we've seen probably in the family Euplectelidae. And there looks like some kind of, that looks like a scale worm near the bottom of the screen inside oh, the yeah. sponge. i turn on my x-ray vision. And this one would also root in sediment rather than attach to a hard substrate. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'm just trying to Thanks drag video. the um, sensitivity down. I can. It's supposed to be the right. 
I do the left mouse to adjust the, where the white line is, and then the right mouse to adjust the color scale. The left mouse kind of does both, and then the right click does just the color. It's it's hard to get a hold of too. Yeah, it's yeah small I'm trying to. Pixels. Oh gosh. Yeah, it's tricky. Okay, Copilot, I'll work my way back to the dive track. You can turn back or we could find yeah. a new heading. What do you let's let's do we kinda wanna I gotta go I think one one two zero oh. maybe you just follow this ridge. Just look at this. Yeah, I think it'll wind up being like one so that might be a little bit more south than we wanna go, but one four zero, something like that. Got okay. fish on the sediment. Copy video, uh, frame it up as I approach. Looks like there's two. Let's see if there's. Uh, there's a. Um, uh, we'll go an lower. Interesting fish with a striped tail that's wiggling in the. Uh, you can zoom in at will as I approach. Painting itself with. Um, I'm going to try to spin around. I haven't seen anything port. like this before. Yeah, I was head. initially going to say halosaur, but that tail movement is not <coughs> normal. Tracy, if Tracy Sutton's still uh, on the chat room, can you fill us in with this one? Well, perhaps it, it, perhaps it is a halo. It's a spiny eel, uh, notocanth. Notocanthid. Thank you. A spiny eel. Yeah, the, the, spines are, the spines are down on the back, but when they're erect, you can kind of see where they would be. Uh, the, the name comes from having those free spines along the back. Thanks very much. Yeah, that's a new record for us for our um, for our expedition so far. Okay, video's clear. Great. Okay. Come on. And another little that dark spot is another. Grab of that, so I'll have a look at it while yeah, uh, I'm uh, yeah. It may it actually be a halo star. I just uh, need to check a thing or two. Yeah. Thanks very much. And there's yeah. this one looks like a serianthid burrowing anemone because it appears to have the two rings of, yeah, I just of cannot grab slender that tentacles. The bottom and bar. you can see how the uh, pteropod what. shells have collected on the down slope side of its burrow. Pretty reflective video. So it has a, a yes. short a inner ring of dark Trapping. tentacles and a an outer ring of longer, paler tentacles. Yeah, we'll let it go. Thanks. So please don't forget, if you are on shore and um, tuning in, or listening, or on the call, please do mute your mic when you're not speaking. Um, we do tend to get a lot of feedback. Right now we can actually hear some, you know, quite appropriate music, yeah, but you know, um, please do mute your mic. Get a move going that way. One, two, zero. I'm going to drop the telephone. Yeah, that sounds like somebody is on hold on the telephone. Thank you. I had to roll and drop the call. Are you ready for a move, co-pilot? Uh, yeah, once. Okay, 30 uh, meters or 20 and meters? And Tracy uh, yeah, just yeah. told us that uh, that fish was a halosaur and probably okay. in the genus Halosauropsis. I guess let's do one, 140. Yeah. And okay. if I'm not mistaken, the name okay. halosaur meters, means 30 meters? salt It's 20, yeah. It's getting okay. steep. Not sure where that came from, unless uh, there's another derivation that I'm not aware of. Right, Let's put on sponge. We'll wait for uh, trip here. And there's another glass sponge in the uh, probably Euplectelidae. Thank you. Yeah, we've seen a couple of these I've videos. I've got two so zero meters bearing one four zero speed decimal two. Is that Just correct? Quick one here, I guess. Copy. Stand by for input. And you can see this one's got another of the commensal polynoids right, within it. And so, as you can see, that animal's quite big. And if we were to zoom on the top end of that 
sponge, we'd see that there was actually Getting almost like a, a grill of glass um, yeah. spicules covering the opening. And so that means that that polynoid cannot escape, that scale worm cannot escape. So what happens is larval, um, larvae of various animals, shrimp do this, um, scale worms do this, actually drift in to the sponge when they're quite small and they find this as a, you know, a safe place to live. And they live there happily for a while, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then before they know it, they are too big to leave and they're effectively trapped inside of these sponges. Conference call has been reestablished. Okay, video, come on when you're done. I'm not hearing it on my line now. Looks like the ship's underway again. And uh, yeah. just off left, you could see how steep the slope is, a good 45 degrees, uh, perhaps a little more. And there's another one of those grooves and beyond it, another one of these whaleback sediment ridges. So those grooves provide an avenue for the downslope movement of sediment. Oh, shit. Working our way up. <laughs> lower left, lower right. Come in. Is what you're talking about? Dead stock with something on top? Or? Possible truffula tree. So this looks like a dead or dying bamboo coral, but on its stalk, you can see there are two amphipods um, holding on, and those will actually be a mating pair of amphipods. Sorry, and this coral stalk is essentially their, their home. And uh, we also have uh, a pair of mycid shrimps, one clinging off to the right side, and another one just swam out of we'll view. Up just a bump here. Are you good for another ship move, co-pilot? Yeah. Pilot's ready. Another 20 meters, 140. Zooming out. All right. Next video. So that was a different, even though it was uh, dying or dead, that was a different species uh, of uh, bamboo coral with a, the tall uh, stalk and then a cluster of um, branches near the tip. So those amphipods were probably in the family Podoceridae Video, you can frame up C star when you're ready. And a nice brittle star. Perhaps an. Uh, it's got a nice purple disc there. Oh, look at that. You can see on the. I don't know the taxonomy of brittle stars here, but in this one, you can see on its purple disc 
at the base of each of its pink arms are a pair of pink discs, and those are the, uh, if I remember correctly, the uh, dors the aboral arm plates, or um, uh, Bob, if you can help me out, I can't remember my, I'm blanking on, on my um, Bridge. Does ophuroid uh, anatomy here. Go ahead, Nav. Uh, uh, let's get another move in. That's going to be range 20 meters, bearing 140, speed 0 decimal 2. Good copy. Read that back. I've got 20 meters, bearing 140, speed decimal 2. Is that correct? That is correct. Copy. Stand by for input. That is a good copy. Thanks. Thank you. So Nav, hopefully that'll take us right Probably to the to uh, harder turns in my sonar. Yeah, we'll grab this crinoid. Yeah. Get some harder turns. Oh yeah, you point those out. Uh, yeah, you can come in real quick. Video. Get us over there. And there's a nice this, little yeah. feather star, a crinoid, clinging to this side. dead uh, stalk with numerous uh, little neck barnacles. The uh, identity of these animals is extremely difficult. It, it's impossible to say in many cases without having an animal look, looking at the bits, the various skeletal parts under the microscope. The family, Fading though, way um, back. Yeah. Traditionally, okay. it's called uh, antidonity, anyway. but recent molecular work has blown that family apart, and the taxonomy has not yet been yeah, worked yeah. out about who's most closely so related. It looks to pretty who. clear right now. Um, <laughs> my colleague at the uh, video Scripps Institute of Oceanography in it's just La Jolla, impossible to get Greg that Rouse, far. is uh, just actually up. working on that. that this is? And yeah, this yeah, is a, an interesting fish, head on. Um, Sorry, I'm floating up. We don't have, um, I don't think uh, anyone can hear us right now uh, on land um, in, the con in. in the science conference call. So um, um, yeah, actually, you may want to chat in and let us know what you think this is. Okay, I can, uh, I'm the only one that can. Right. So, uh, if Tracy is still on shore, or perhaps anybody on shore knows what they think this um, fish might be, I this angle is a bit strange to try and identify it. But try I mean, I'm going to go with some kind of ophidiid, yeah. which is a cuskiel. So um, it's got somewhere. this very uh, bulbous head, um, um, an eel-like tail. And around Tracy here. informs us that it's a little bit, ophidiform fish, a cusk eel, indeed. Um, and like a lot of the bottom-associated fishes that we'll see swimming just above the bottom here in very deep water, it yeah. lacks pretty much any pigment. And so many of these are uh, typically elongated, either eel-like or semi-eel-like, and uh, gray or uh, yeah. Pale gray and um, elongated, and typically in many cases with to. tiny little eyes. Probably let it go pretty soon, video. All right, thanks. Excellent. Okay, so we got nice hard returns of Sirius, range two five ish. Okay, yeah, a little, little more maybe, but. Might be able to at least go over there and light it up. Get a good idea of what we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. And like we that. see a little bit more outcrop here. As a matter of fact, here you can see two of the uh, ridges, That's and cool beyond view. it, there's yeah. more outcrop exposed in the valley. So we should go over and take a Some look at that. Some rocks or something over there. Dark. Yeah. And more of those down slope streaks that we've seen before. This is more promising. 
Ooh, if you look at the view in the Sirius cam, we can see we're approaching quite a, a gully almost here. Video, can we bring out the darks in the background there, just for navigation? And so purposes. we're moving into much steeper terrain now, right, and as a result, out, we're mapping. expecting to see, see a lot more hard view. substrate yeah. and Thanks. the animals associated Thanks. with those, which will probably be things oh, like corals yeah. and sponges. Thank you, Bridge. Workshop, this is Navigator. And you can also see here the distinction between the very white limestone and the uh, black, Check out blackened nice limestone, which has been covered by a, uh, up. a mineral crust. Um, some question about whether it's um, ferromanganese or phosphoritic. Yeah, I'm not enough crazy. of a geologist and then it's um, just the ravine here to my to say we've been chatting about that. Now nah, let me know when that ship moves done. Uh, we just finished. Okay, let's do another one at 150. 20 meters? 20 sounds good. Uh, if we can find a smaller piece of that bridge, white this is if we can drop right, down no. a little uh, bit next into that move gully. Is gonna be Range um, two zero meters, bearing one five zero degrees. Of that white speed limestone. zero decimal two. I think the uh, University of Miami geologist would uh, like a piece. Two zero meters, bearing one five zero speed decimal two. I'm not sure correct? how friable, how breakable Good copy it bridge. is. Copy stand by for input. That uh, little exposure down in the gully, or how wide the gully is. Looks like there may be some lasers. Uh, yeah, you can some material Just there. Like Can't that. quite tell from here. X. Coming down. I don't see any candidates down there. No. There do I. Harvey Nat Bridge. Move is initiated. Two zero meters. Bearing one five zero. Speed decimal two. Thank you, Bridge. And uh, Andrea Quattrini has told us that that big-headed fish that almost looked like a tadpole is Acanthonus Curvy armatus. sponge on the left. Yeah. Might be worth a snap. More shop. This is now snap. anybody down there? Hello. And there's a little curled-up glass sponge with a brittle star underneath it. Looked like that sponge was growing in one direction and decided, no, I think I'll better grow in another direction here. So the lasers are 10 centimeters apart. Which is about four inches. Yeah, I'm trying to fix it, but I mean, it seems that we've got to... Below and to the left, there looked like there might be some... Kind of a rocky material place down below there right. the contrast I can't quite tell to the lower right of the um, of that white mass where they're uh, overhanging air yeah, do Good. do straight ahead there I don't know if you how easy it is to get in there okay so if you're right over click. here here but some of that looks lo like it might be loose and then you yeah all right. Maybe the uppermost of those, uh, directly above the laser, there's a small piece, and then another one covered by sediment above it, right where the lasers are now. Possibly. All right, that is what I was looking for. So, fun fact about that last. Can zoom out a little bit, video. Um, fish we saw, Canthonus armatus. I knew I had seen it before, and its common name is the bony eared ass fish. And it just is one of the funniest, you know, names, I think, in up? science. And uh, I just couldn't think where I had seen this fish once because of so that funny name. It's commonly referred to, um, or it's referred to a eight lot because yeah. of that name. But it's found in I'd tropical and here. subtropical oceans at depths from about Bridge. one Disney kilometer to four and a half kilometers. Go ahead, Nav. Uh, let's Go and, and it um, is the only the member I mean, of that genus, right interestingly. Yeah. And it holds Roger, the record the for the Thank smallest brain-to-body weight ratio <laughs> of all vertebrates. So I don't know if that's where the name comes from, but... 
Yokianos has rejoined the conference call. Watch Lee, this is Pilot. Did you want us to poke at Thanks. some of the rocks down here? I heard you talking about them, but I don't know if um, you want to really Yeah, stop. if you think you can get into a position that you feel comfortable with and you see something that's loose, uh, okay. exactly where those lasers are, yeah. perhaps there may be something. If not, we'll move on and look somewhere else. Okay, I could give it a poke with the manipulator. Great, uh, thank you. Yeah. Now, Bridge, we are holding this position. Arms. Thank you, Bridge. If we're going to swing it all, we're going to want to back it up a little. Or I can come way up. How much swing you got left? You want me to bring it up back, back 10 meters? Up, yeah, like 5 yeah. meters. Okay. Are you comfortable, Copilot? For me to land or not? We got me to. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Alright. I'll spin up HPU for you, but just be ready to Bridge. go straight Enough. up if, uh, yeah. if I start yelling. Leave it to I'm going to lose you for a minute. It should be alright. If you're not comfortable, Copa, I can... Nav, did you call us for it? Yep. Okay, go ahead. Uh, if you check out the Sirius view camera, uh, you, you can see how deep and narrow camera. this little Gully Let me read that back to you. A That's a range cannon. of 10 meters, bearing 330 at a speed of 0.1. Alright, you got hydraulics up. These are pretty stuck in here. More, they're just gonna crumble if they try. Nav bridge. Go ahead, bridge. Move initiated. Range one zero meters. Bearing three three zero. Speed decimal one. That one's one. loose on top. Copy. I think it's pretty. Friable here. I'm worried that the jaws are going to crush it. Uh, Perhaps try the one above it. Or any little piece that we get will be uh, useful. No. It's almost more of like a sediment. Oh, yeah. Uh, I could, uh, that one there. Maybe. How are we looking? Go, Pat. We're okay. All right. button kind of acting up. Yeah, it's sticking a little. It's just out of reach. Okay, so that one's just out of reach, actually. Um, I can try to see if any of this is... here. I don't think you're going to get any of these. Okay. Yeah, watch lead. Uh, I don't think these are in reach or uh, I think they're too friable or small or stuck in this particular position. So. All right. Then we have to go on. I think we're better off moving on here.
Thank you for trying. Yep. So once you stow, you're just going to want to back it up. Yep. Because your swing arms are, are still out. They, they look okay. You're just kind of down in that gully. All right. I'm going to spin you down here. Push it up. Delta 24. As we come up this uh, nice. blackened face, immediately we see a lot more attached life. Video, you let me? Yeah. Uh, shelf dema sponges like bracket fungi. The long, slender um, organisms are possibly our uh, glass sponges. And uh, to the right of center is one of those flattened triangular mucus webs. Still not sure what makes those. If anybody can chime in, that would be nice. I saw those on my first dive. I've seen them on uh, about... Yeah, my partial. first dive was 42 years ago on Alvin in the Tongue of the Ocean when it was still uh, launched from bridge. the uh, pontoon barge Lulu. Go ahead, Barry. Here you can see Just one letting of you those. know that we have reached the end of the position. I assume move. it's some kind of worm. Thank you, Bridge. But I don't know. Whatever uh, built it is, um, I assume, back in, in the house, and it's uh, in a hole at the apex of the triangle someplace. It looks like a funnel web spider's web in certain respects. But what is making it, I don't know. And the little tiny, uh, the, the small hanging down branches and uh, um, things that are covering the rocks here are all agglutinating foraminiferans. Video's clear. Extremely Bio's abundant, clear. probably the most abundant visible fauna here. Like raining. Uh, Chuck, I'll just uh, say that uh, you know this darker uh, surface suggests that there's this barrel up here with you. manganese crust, which uh, would be a harder substrate, and as a result, you could potentially get that kind of material picked up where that uh, more soft material was um, uh, difficult. However, you know, just knowing how soft that is, is is interesting. You know, just looking on the video and seeing those holes in there, um, it's hard to understand how, how uh, soft think, or hard get, that, that yeah, surface is. So we we it's, just see it's going to stay this was, deep, I think, uh, a little bit. Uh, Whiskey coral on the right with um, those sponges. At, yeah, at some stage, maybe, at a, uh, maybe more likely those, on a more horizontal surface. This uh, darker material, there I'll might be an easier sponges. rock to Can pick up. And, uh, Come in, video. So just keep an eye out for that, I think. Uh, thanks very much, Bill. We will definitely do that. Here are uh, two or three different species of sponges all in a row and a very delicately branched um, colony that uh, can't oh, quite tell, top. maybe a, yeah, uh, an antipatherian yeah. black coral above them. We're going to do our uh, pilot change up here real quick. Video can come wide. And below left is another kind of glass sponge on a long slender stalk. I don't remember the name of that one. And this entire outcrop here, this massive wall, is dusted with uh, uh, fine sediment and uh, detritus that has come down from surface waters.
Are you guys changing crew here? So we are changing crew, hanging uh, here in the water column until our um, ROV crew has uh, switched the watch and we'll move on. Kimberly Galvez ashore has remarked that uh, she All finds right. it fascinating that the marine snow, this uh, fine um, material, appears to be cascading down at? over this the thing? hard grounds as if there's next to no current. And certainly the um, sponges, which generate their own current, do not need yeah, so we just got to this uh, ridge. We're trying to stay to the north-ish yeah. side of it so that if this current and the fact that the, uh, or the wind and the current that we sort do not of blows see around, we like sea fans, will likely um, and, uh, tend other towards the uh, northeast. Reflects the fact that there probably is not so much more, li flow more likely to blow us off the, along the whole ridge that way. Right. Rather than up it. You can't hear me. I can. Uh, I love but that not glass distinctly. I can't remember sort of sounded like. Go ahead. I'm listening now. See this ridge? Yeah. We're trying to stay sort of the northern, northern yep. but along it. But it's another example of how an organism off, that wants into. to capture particles cool. from the passing water volume uh, is at an advantage if it can stick out further from the sediment, from the wall rather, Let's see. because the closer you no are to samples the substrate, yet, it seems. the weaker the current will be. What are we looking at, video? See that uh, sponge or the wispy coral on the upper right? Has Watch Lead requested any of them? I'll just make they a briefly uh, mentioned it as that, we were flying uh, around in the process of doing the change. Uh, where you have had a we'll bit of uh, accumulation of the sediment, there's a fair number of the pteropod shells in it. And normally, I would assume that those come very episodically, very rarely, would uh, be in, uh, coming down from pelagic uh, waters. And so that the rate of sedimentation uh, would coral likely top be center. very slow. And uh, so the accumulation uh, uh, that that rapid. Thanks very much, Bill. Watch the pilot. Yes. Yeah, as you saw, we just had a uh, shift change, and so we're kind of waiting on uh, your direction to continue on here. Uh, before we do that, though, we'd like to do our introductions, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Go ahead. Roger. Thank you, Watchley. We just did our 1130 shift change. We have a new front row. Sitting in pilot right now is Bobby Moore. And along with my fellow uh, co-workers who will introduce themselves in a moment, we are all engineers from the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration, or GFOE. To my right, in the co-pilot seat, Sean Kennison. And over here on my left. In the navigator seat, Jeffrey Lanning. Who do we have over there at the far end? The far right in the shadows is Roland O'Brien, video engineer. And? And in the back, in the video clipping station, I'm Emily Nero. Thank you very much for those introductions. And thank you uh, for... Thank you for uh, being here with us. We're excited to uh, continue this dive, especially now that we're on this... Uh, steeper wall. 
Video swapping out. Copy that. Heading up slope. General direction. So of now that we have, have our been new watch, between one two zero uh, and one five zero, and uh, looks like they took a little bounce north, maybe to get to Lauren the northern end of this next ridge. To me. She's our new mapping uh, person. So, yeah. Yep. Looks like we're on the north side from the Bathy. Does your sonar agree? Mostly. So looks like it's just dead ahead. She's okay. Changed, what are you uh, facing? One four zero one three five. Here now. And we're going to head up okay. slope. Okay. Now, I think that may have been a crinoid down below, but we'll probably see more of them. And there's another stalk glass sponge and a small sea star. Great. Could you drop down a, a little bit to look at that yellow sea lily that you was down it. there? Somebody pointed out it might be something new. It was ye uh, yellow. It wasn't too far down. There it is, uh, uh, left of center. If we could zoom in on that. I missed it before. It blended in with the background. Uh, Tina Molotsova picked it out. And that is a hyocrinid. That family of crinoids has never been reported from the Western Atlantic, as far as I know. So that is probably a new species and a new record. And if it's at all possible, it's uh, it would be wonderful co to collect. Thank you very much, Tina. Oh, that was on. a brilliant spot. That's a good start. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a, I focus on crinoids. I know them well enough to know that that family hyocrinidae has never been reported um, and never been published on anyway from the uh, Gulf of Mexico, or as far as I know, from the Western Atlantic. As you already know, probably no samples. Box are wide open. And be wary of the index button. Yeah, that's what I hear. Four or five of us have had trouble with it sticking. These crinoids always ha almost always have just the five undivided arms. They occur in much greater numbers, for example, on sea mounts along the west coast of the U.S. Uh, they're found in exclusively in deeper water. I think the shallowest ones are no shallower than a thousand meters. And uh, when you uh, look at them up close, you see that the uh, video. Let's go in. They get superficially zoom. resemble some in. of the ancient fossil crinoids more closely than any of the other living crinoids. And there, oh, the, there you can see all of the slender, the, yeah, if you want to turn them, turn thread-like tube feet that are spread out from the side branches up. or pinules of the arms. And uh, those are equivalent to the suckered little tube feet of sea stars. So basically, a, um, a crinoid, a sea lily, is like a starfish on a stick but it has uh, these slender filamentous tube feet instead of suckered tube feet. And when a particle of drifting plankton or planktonic organism comes by, those filaments will flick and carry and flick the uh, particle into a groove down the side branch, which has got microscopic cilia, hairs, and they will carry that particle wrapped in mucus down conveyor belt style to the mouth in the middle. Hot ziggity. All right, uh, video you. You're, if you're okay with that, let's come on. I, I got hydraulics. Can you, and you can bring up the mini Zeus if you'd like. Arm coming live. Arm is live.
pilot whatever of the stock you can get. It's uh, attached uh, like a, some of the other Carl's uh, via a cemented disc and uh, sh the stock should uh, snap off from that pretty easily. It should snap off the wall. Well, either the stock will break or the uh, hold fast will come off. Either one is, is it, fine. Is there a preference? I was just going to cut uh, as close um, to the base as I can, but we I, can try to pluck if I you'd think rather. You, I think if you uh, don't cut, don't bother cutting. Okay. Um, it should come off. All right. Or if you do cut, that's fine. If cutting assures that it comes off, that's fine too. We don't need the base of it. Roger that. Don't need the base. We'll get as far down as we can. Brilliant job. Okay, coming off the wall. It uh, doesn't matter. Okay. Is there any dive if you want, we can five. go starboard from one end lead port open for five. some reason. You can go ahead and bring up mini series, or uh, Sirius, sorry, just so I don't. Where's my sensors? I'm not getting quite bottom lock, so. Auto head, auto depth. Yeah, we're not getting bottom lock, so I'm just going to have to float. Okay. Yep. Okay, we're going starboard. While we're uh, collecting that, I might mention that crinoids, like all other echinoderms, in addition to their five-sided symmetry, Yes, have please. a unique and just keep kind of me. I don't have bottom lock. Oh, I do now. Called connective tissue or mutable collagenous yep. tissue. It's a kind of ligament, but it can go from soft and flaccid to rigid under nervous control. And so, for example, a sea urchin has a ring of muscle and a ring of this kind of ligament at the base of all of its spines. So when the ligament is flaccid, the muscle can rotate the spine in different directions. And then when the ligament is turned rigid, the spine locks down in place. So these crinoids, the feather stars and the sea lilies, have this kind of ligament between all of the little segments that, uh, of calcium carbonate that make up their arms. And so what they do is they can use their muscles to extend the arms uh, out into the current and then lock the ligaments in place so that they can keep their arms spread out for filter telephone. feeding in the current and not expend any energy. It's a very efficient yeah. system. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's like angled up towards you a little bit. So I have to angle the wrist to shove it in there a little bit. I'm just going to turn around and go the opposite way. At the end of my turn.
way I have it gripped, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get it tucked in there. You're almost there now. What do we think? Just give a little wiggle with the wrist, see if it gets off the edge of the box and falls in. Yeah. Might. Maybe I'll just loosen slowly. Yeah, it might fall in. There it goes. Yep. Stem fell. Did the no, head the head's in. in. Yep. The oh head's no, good. it's still in my grip. Oh yeah, you got it. Starboard error. That went starboard inner. Brilliantly right. done. Thank you, gentlemen. And that's a paper waiting to be written. And you definitely saw it in there, right? Yeah. Okay. okay, once we're in right. place, we will uh, start Still moving on. up the uh, cliff face again. Nice work. See what we can see. Okay, and I draw. So that was the, f as if I believe. Gosh, that um, made me realize I have not put that something was the in the starboard box in a long time. That was the first record of this family of crinoids <laughs> yeah, Sean from was this hard on you. part of the world. Hmm? Sean was making it hard on you. No, I mean it was my own suggestion, but I just the angles. But I got it in. All right. And I'm not just saying that because I wanted it. All right, continuing up. We've seen that uh, stalked glass sponge before. I can't remember the name. It looked like uh, we might have just passed a sea star down left, and there's a large anemone. Um, uh, you can leave it where it was. Can I only we zoom it up in on that anemone in. at right, please? Yes, and we can. And there's another of those hyacrinid crinoids at left, the ones that we just collected. Yes, as I was coming in, I wasn't quite sure if I'd hit my toes or my brow first. I was pretty sure it was toes, but wanted to double check. Yep, I like where you have it. Go ahead, And video. below that um, hey, is... Just to let you know sure. that, uh, I'm back on the line. Thank you very much, Scott. This, uh, that's a lovely anemone. Um, I have no idea what it is. Um, it looks similar. Scott, do you know uh, whether this might, or anyone, um, Andrea, um, if this might be a coralomorph or just a regular anemone? I don't know the... Yeah, you know, this is really hard. Um, I was going to suggest possibly coralomorph. They seem to be more uh, diaphanous. Can't tell if we're looking at a branch pentacle there, or if just one in front of the other. Yeah, I, th and, uh, um, many of these yeah, I think it's have uh, dematocysts right in the tips. You can see those white tips to the tentacles, and also all those uh, dots that are on the tentacles are also uh, nematocysts. Those are the, the batteries of stinging cells that are common in all the cnidaria. Um, however, there are some true sea anemones mm -hmm. that have this basic morphology. So, uh, you know, not being an expert, it's really hard to distinguish them. 
and ultimately it's something that uh, you would need a specimen of to look at the histology to get an accurate identification. Right, and, and you're right, it does look like at least a couple of those tentacles are forked. There's one at upper uh, right at about 2 o'clock and one straight in the, in the center. Those are definitely forked. There you go, I'm stationary. Uh, as far as I can video. tell. Very nice, thank you. Coming down a little bit. Keep you yeah, but we could see through the oral disc quite well, light. and what I could see of the body column is quite Come transparent. So I like this as a Corallomorph, Corallomorpharian, which is another order of the, um, the hexacorals. So related to the down sea anemones and the here. stony corals and the zoanthids and the black there. corals, more closely related to those groups than they are to the uh, octocorals. Right. Thanks Some very much. Suggested, Chuck, uh, maybe you could talk about this. Some have suggested these are naked corals, but there's uh, the jury's kind of out on that. Yes, I remember reading something about that, that uh, there was some suggestion that these corallomorphs, hence the name, uh, coral form, uh, might actually be Video um, clear. Let me know. phylogenetically within we'll the stony clear. corals and just have lost the skeleton. But as you say, I think the jury is still out on that. Uh, as opposed to uh, the alternative that they're perhaps a sister group, uh, uh, an evolutionary neighbor to the stony corals. That's a beautiful image. Right, exactly. And part of the reason the, the mm -hmm. debate is there is well. that there are aspects of the morphology that we can't see here. For example, the siphonoglyph, it's a groove that goes into the mouth. There are basic aspects to the morphology that suggest it's very, very similar to a stony coral polyp compared to, for example, an anemone polyp or some of the other hexacorals. Right, and, uh, and Scott mentions hexacorals. That's the group of um, these organisms that have their um, inner partitions and their tentacles in, um, arranged in multiples of six, whereas the octocorals, hence the name, have their uh, inner partitions or mesenteries uh, and tentacles uh, numbering in eight. And could we zoom in on that uh, colony right below the lasers there, that br slender branching colony? Go ahead, Peter. I'll do that now. Okay, that is a, what is that? That is a largely dead octocoral. Is that, that's a bamboo coral. Uh, Scott, you want to weigh in on that as uh, it appears to have these slender branches? Yeah, I'm trying to see it. I, I can't see the Stand nodes by, yet. Maybe you can. I thought it might be a chrysogorgia. So oh, okay. Coral. Um, you, uh, you pilot, can we uh, focus on the stem that's out of focus there, lower left, yeah. Stand Looking by. for the nodes that characterize a bamboo coral, and I'm not okay. seeing them offhand. All right, video, go so ahead. you're right, Scott, it's down. more yeah. likely a Chrysogorgiad. Yeah, you can see the way the polyps are almost like little dew drops on a skeleton. That's the way I think about Chrysogorgiad polyps. Um, Really yeah. not sure like what it would be if it's a Chrysogorgiid, although, no, now I see the nodes. Okay, I can see some nodes. So this is indeed a bamboo. Oh, yeah, I see one, too, yes. This They're not uh, terribly form. obvious. A branching form. Not sure I could Maybe identify the it. Uh, there. there is something called Corradoitis really. flexibilis, which not grows. Uh, there are actually a variety of species of bamboo coral that grow as what we call kind of a bramble. Uh, very thin branches and kind of a mass of branches, no regular pattern. Yeah, it's not like a fan or anything like that. And yeah. I'm trying to yeah, I'm not at the best angle, get sorry, a polyp yeah. in focus. Can we uh, get Pretty the polyps in front in focus? Like the, yeah, a little anyway, more. There you go. I'm going right now. Let's go for that one that's top left. It's actually facing us. There we go. Yeah. I think Scott had to ring off. There's a little um, shrimp. That's an amp that's an amphipod, I think. Yes. Hello and goodbye. That worked. That helped.
Watch leads, do we want... Are you going to want a different view? Let's go on that far stock video while we're sitting here. Since we're not hearing anything. Yeah, a wonderful view of uh, what we call the intertentacular sclerites. So those are the needle-like spines that you see at the base of each of those tentacles. Um, and that's just one small example of the many sclerites that are embedded in the tissue. Those are made of calcium carbonate and they form a bit of a supporting skeleton. Um, earlier on when we were looking at those whip corals in the sediments, I noted that the polyp bent halfway along because you had two rows of those spines and so it bent in between. The other thing we can use for taxonomy when we review these images and video after the cruise is you note that the tip of the skeleton has no polyp right at the tip. Um, there's tissue on it. Um, so the leading sure edge I'm of the branch so does not have a polyp. Uh, so that is interesting. In some of the species, for example, of Achenella, there is a polyp right at the growing tip. Beautiful view. You can see the mouth ringed by orange. And it looks like uh, the second polyp there has a tentacle tilted over into the mouth. So perhaps it's captured something and uh, is transferring it to the mouth. Oh, yeah, great spot. Um, we just had our lunch on the ship as well. <laughs> That's a good segue, Diva. You know, everyone's hungry down in the deep sea, as well as on the Oceanus Explorer. I tell you, you know, despite all the opportunities we've had to see right. this, we've never I'm actually ready, seen a coral polyp, or I've never right, actually seen a coral polyp in the deep sea. Uh, grabbing something and feeding beings. on it. I sure would like to see that someday. I've seen plenty of things feeding on the coral. The second one he said? Yeah, okay. Okay, that's great, pilots. We're happy to move on when you are. Roger that. That's the cue video whenever you're ready. So we're seeing some more of these glass sponges. We think maybe um, euplectelids. Like the wall's almost 25 meters out. I'll give you guys another little bit and then get a move on. We're at two kilometers. And this is much more the terrain we were expecting during this dive. During, uh, the dive. The primary focus of this dive was meant to be um, geological in nature. We wanted to compare the geological composition and origin of between you know 2,300 meters and 1,900 meters um, in this area of very incised escarpments. Could we do a quick zoom on that white? Let's go ahead, for you. Blob. By. So this is another one of the so sea cucumbers which we saw um, earlier in the dive on sediment. The last couple days, uh, it's likely go, oligokinus. Let me make sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. No, Ololinius, sorry, Ololinius. And um, here you can see they cover themselves in these pteropod shells. And, and this type of um, covering is they thought to be unique to the Gulf of Mexico. They do also cover themselves with sponge spicules and um, forearms, but this is just really something, and we were speculating that perhaps it could be because it makes it much less appetizing um, if something tries to come along and eat it. Oh, we'll let it go off. <laughs> come on, please. Um, can we have a quick zoom on this yellow coral? Dead ahead, please. Go ahead, video. Describe it from here. Mm. 
This is beautiful. So you can see there's a sponge living on one of the rock um, outcrops there as well as this beautiful branching yellow coral. I can't quite tell. There's a larger colony just off to the right. Stand by, watch lead. We'll get you a much better Sure. Thank you, pilots. The first uh, gross view there may have been a Cantagorgia, possibly. And on these Lost ones, you can toe. really see the the polyps with the eight tentacles very, very clearly. Sorry, video. Try it one more time. And that is why they're called octocorals. Sean, can you take my camera? Thanks. Our coral biologists Hold in the up. chat room, which include um, Amanda Demopoulos, Asako Matsumoto, okay. uh, Scott France and Tina Moltzova and Sandra Brooke um, seem to be a little stumped by this one. But so you can see there's a... Yeah, with this closer view, I'm going to stick with the Cantagorgia on this one. You yes, can see that the, the tissue along the axis is really, really thin, and the polyps are extremely distinct from it, fairly tall. Um, so I think that's probably a good guess that it's in the family of Cantagorgia today. Thanks, Scott. And at the top, you can just see there's a tiny, tiny little brittle star, or ophiroid, um, living on the top polyp, as well as what looks like a piece of sponge that may have been caught there. And then on the second stalk just behind, there's an amphipod, I think. But all of these coral colonies host um, incredible communities, sometimes on the animal itself. So there'll be things like squat lobsters, crinoids, amphipods, shrimp, ophiroids, basket stars, you name it. Um, these octocorals and other types of big branching colonies do tend to have their own little community of commensals living within them. Okay, that's great, pilots. Thank you. And so this is one of the best things about telepresence. You know, we have all of these other scientists and stakeholders ashore, and they're seeing these video feeds at the same time that we are, perhaps just one or two seconds delayed. And it means that they can have an entire debate that we are privy to um, about what it exactly it is we are looking at. So Scott seems to think that yellow coral was an acanthogorgia um, or within the family acanthogorgidae, but yet Asako and Tina aren't totally convinced yet. So it really means that, you know, there's this collaborative um, nature as well as really great discussions that happen, um, which you wouldn't usually get at sea because at sea you Copy can that. only have One quite a, a localized group of scientists that okay. um, would be quite limited in their expertise. And um, some of our geologists on shore, Kimberly Galvez, for instance, are Ready just in finding these outcrops absolutely incredible. And I mean, for a better view, please Rovinav, do go to camera two, to. which is the serious right, view. Can we get a ship move, please? You can see there are yes, sir, sort of these um, like finger-like outcrops. And degrees as we're getting at further and further up these structures, Bridge, we are seeing many more suspension meters. feeders, Bearing some one, more of the yellow zero, acanthogorgids, um, some of the white pink isidids. And that's because usually um, being quite far off the seafloor yep. means that you're in a position more primed for receiving food, which is brought by in the currents. Go ahead and bring my left swing arm in, my port. So if we could please have a look at this little um, community coming up with the branching coral, please. Let's 
So you don't think you'll be able to reach oh, there's it? There's quite a lot coming up. Mm -hmm. You don't um, think you'll be able to reach it? I can see potentially some crinoids in the distance, but then we've got this lovely Baby. little um, aggregation you, of animals here. for this here. branch sticking out right here? Yeah. And you have to think, why I'm is there too. such a huge concentration trouble. of animals right here in this spot, which is, you know, only two, three, three feet long? Um, Perhaps it's I mean, a spot a where, spot where, you know, currents pass by more favorably, or um, oh, an area it. which is where the geology is a little bit here, different to that of the surrounding areas, although I think that may not be the case in this particular instance. If you can reach it, it's just a straight down grab versus like trying to reach between your toes really close. Oh no, I was going to put my left side up and sit down on that nub on the other okay, side. Okay, gotcha. so we've got um, an octocoral uh, in the front. Um, potentially, I am no coral biologist, but potentially a um, plexorid with these uh, little yellow nubbins. We've also got a brittle star living on this octocoral. And you can see it's just unfurling one of its arms. The best branch is going to be this top one here that we're looking at. Um, getting the spiky ball right Absolutely to the left. Absolutely beautiful the, imagery. Directly to the left of the lasers. Shouldn't so be Andrew Catrini thinks that this may be Paramaurisia. Um, and and at this depth, and in this location, potentially Paramaurisia biscaya. We'll give it a Tina shot. Molotsova seems to concur. And then there was also a Chrysogorgia just below this coral. Um, and these are these sort of uh, cotton candy-like coral structures. Oh, what is that? Yeah. Scientists um, are sure I am baffled and have no idea what that white spiky structure is. So this coral um, that we're looking at right here is dead. Um, you can see most of the soft tissue has disappeared, and instead there's this sedimented mucusy stuff, which could be agglutinated forearms living on it. But then there's this white structure, which I am just really not sure what that is. Yeah, I, I was... Uh sitting here talking to someone, so I didn't even notice when he got to this uh, coral, and I am also a little bit flummoxed at this. I don't know if this is some oh, kind I, of I odd egg case. Right yeah, that's that exactly what I was thinking. What? But for what, no. though? You can look on your well, port minute space. Yeah, I, I sure don't shoulder, recognize actually. it. Oh, yeah, there's more. My shoulder. So this Chrysogorgid, we can see yeah, here, um, you can see it's half, some of the branches are dead and that they're missing tissue, whereas some are, are still alive and you can see they've got these beautiful little polyps on them. Um, I'm not sure what those would, would be potentially eggs of. Yeah, I'd get my force feedback. back. This, um, so pilots, this is a potential collection option. Do you think you, you're in position to be able to do that? So grip force one does not oh, it's, kind of, it's a little sticky. No pressure. Um, Diva, while uh, you're waiting for an answer there, I'll just point out this is a nice view to see the sort of golden hue of the uh, Chrysogorgid skeleton. And that Chrysogorgia that trans translates into uh, golden coral and is a reference to that sort of golden iridescent color of the skeleton itself. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, and can we get a, a little bit of a wider view of the whole colony, please, um, of this Chrysogorgid coral? Might just have to go for the whole thing. Um, okay, if you could just hold off for a minute or two more. Okay, so again, the wonders of telepresence. Our scientists on board are totally flummoxed by whatever that was, as mm. well as several scientists on shore. But Les Watling from the University of Hawaii um, has come in and said that those spiky structures we were looking at on the ends of some of those branches are um, uh, ascothoracids, which are actually a type of crustacean endoparasite. No? 
I may be getting that. Oh, no, right. Okay, so it's a type of barnacle. Um, and they live parasitically on um, octocorals. And that is something yeah. I have never seen before. And I'm guessing for many of the scientists tuning in, they also have never seen something like that. Tina is saying she saw something like this similarly from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, meaning the Chrysogorgid we're looking at. Andrea, however, is saying that she's never seen this Chrysogorgid before. I mean, so there are a couple scientists in the chat room who are left. advocating a collection of piece of this Chrysogorgid. Actually, give me a few bumps left, please. Um, can we zoom in to the middle branch where there is a spiky uh, barnacle as well as part of the branches living? Exactly. So just um, exactly that one. Thank you. So do you think it'd be possible to try and collect one of the branches that has one of the spiky barnacles as well as living coral? Okay. Okay, that sounds, um, yeah, really good. If you think you'd be able to do that, we would be absolutely over the moon. So Les Watling, again, from the University of Hawaii, is saying that he's seen these types of parasites. Um, oh, no, or perhaps he's referring to the coral. Les, could you clarify? Did you mean you've seen this coral or the parasites in the Bahamas? And if Tina says she's also seen something similar at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, that means that this coral we're looking at here could have a range from the uh, eastern Gulf of Mexico all the way into the central Atlantic. Get out of this dust clown that I made you kick up. All right, watch lead. We're just going to rise up above this dust cloud that we created and turn back towards the wall. Yes, we can. Go ahead and put it Coming back. Coming. Perfect. video when you're clear. Okay.
coming back toward you. We need to do less zigzagging and more up. Check out this large white thing over here, and then we'll do a little more vertical. Awesome collection by our very skilled pilots. Um, we were just able to collect a Chrysogorgia, which um, yeah. we're not quite sure of the species. Yeah. But also, um, it had these very strange parasitic crustaceans living on it. Uh, it the crustaceans it used to be considered to be barnacles, but they no longer are. Now they've been given their own right. infraclass, um, and they That's are found throughout the world's oceans and are parasitic on cnidarians, so things like corals and anemones and so on, as well as echinoderms. And up until today, I have never heard of them. So it's always... Um, a really good day when you see something that you didn't know existed up until that point. Sounds great, thank you. So as we're moving up here, ooh, can we have a look at the blue colony dead ahead, please? So as we're moving up, we can see um, another Isidid. Those are the long whip-like ones right. um, that j don't have any branches. Perhaps Lepidisis would be the genus on that one. But this one, to me, looks like... Uh, it's on the other side of this edge. Oh, no, perhaps it is the same Isidid as we've been looking at. No, so this one is um, a primnoid coral, I think. And this is a different family of octocoral. Any chance we could... Nope, took the word straight out of my mouth. Keep coming up. So yes, I'm earning my coral stripes. Uh, the coral biologists on show are agreeing. This is a primnoid. And you can see they've got um, a really different branching morphology as well as the way the polyps are arranged on each of the branches are very, very different to the isidids that we were looking at before, as well as the um, paramyrsia, which are plexorids. That's great, pilots. Uh, another thing oh. about uh, the Pinoids, they have, uh, they're in the suborder Calcaxonia, and that's referring to calcium carbonate that's embedded with the protein in the main skeleton. So the skeleton of these uh, corals is much stronger than the skeletons of the uh, sea fans, the paramaricids. Thanks, Scott. Go ahead, Nav. <laughs> I was like, wow, we've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> okay, great. So um, we are, have a little over two hours um, left in the benthic portion of this dive, and we still have about 500 and so uh, roughly meters to carry on up slope. So we're going to try to get a move on, but... Uh, if you do see something that's very exciting, or we see something new, of course, nah, we will Bridge, stop and get zooms. And uh, perhaps, an if it's Absolutely. interesting enough, what would you like this time? collect we'll it. We'll do an additional one zero meters, bearing one three zero degrees at two tenths of a knot. 
Bridge copies a move of one zero meters, bearing one three zero, speed zero decimal two knots. Great, thanks, That's Nav. Perfect. So, Perfect. correction, Roger three that. hours left in the dive. So, during that time, we should be able to cover quite a bit of ground heading up the slope. And it'll be interesting to see whether, um, as it's likely the substrate won't differ, whether the, whether the colonies or, sorry, communities will differ um, because of differences in depth or um, current regime and so on. ROV NAV, bridge. Go ahead, bridge. Let's okay, I've entered a move of one zero meters, bearing one three zero, speed zero decimal two knots, initiating now. Good copy, thank you, bridge. You're welcome. Uh, NAV and pilot, it's not absolutely crucial, but we would like to make some more headway, obviously. So this is an absolutely beautiful glass sponge. Um, I'm not very good with my sponges, so I am not quite sure. Just keep uh, coming out. Okay, let's come on. Looks like a much larger one here on the left side. Okay, we're on our way. Moving along. Again, one? some more of these glass sponges. Because no? okay. we did pick one uh, before. So. Okay. And the scale of the structure that we're climbing is just enormous. If you turn to the Sirius feed, so camera two, Great. you really see, I mean, this, the size of this sort of uh, promontory feature which we've just we're just circling as well as how it fits into the the ground the picture. Nav, bridge. bridge nav that's a complete move thank you bridge yep you can see there's quite a couple dead sponges um the live sponges tend to be a bluey whitey color whereas the dead sponges tend to match a little bit more with the sediment and that's usually becomes because sediment gets trapped within the skeleton, looking, the fibers of the skeleton. It, oh, so can we zoom on that sea star, please? I don't want, Dead I don't ahead. want, I don't want to compound too many if you're not feeling them. Yep. Have you been rising much? Okay. Okay. Give it another minute or two, and if it looks like you guys want more, so we can tack on more. So this is one of the coral eating starfish it's in the family goniasteridae and we frequently see them actually climbing up very precariously onto the isidid bamboo corals or so on munching away at the coral tissue and you'd actually see they leave a trail where the skeleton is completely exposed where they've munched away and killed that part of the colony should we get a closer look and this is a perfect example just above of, um, I'm not sure what this posture is about, why one arm is sort of flipped limply in front, but um, you can also see the, the comparison between, this is a dead sponge we're looking at here, and you can see it very much matches the color of the sediment, whereas just to the left and below it are live sponges. You might want to play with the uh, swing arms, co-pilot. I'm going to set my toes in. Alright, 
go ahead video. What happens if you turn one of our lower ones inboard? Since they're up and stowed. I think I already saw a change. Oh, and this is a beautiful Chrysler Gorgia colony with a um, Uralid, I'm pretty sure, Brittle Star living on it. And these Brittle Stars are a little bit different to other Brittle Stars because they've got extremely curly arms and look a little bit more similar to Basket Stars, which are um, Gorgonocephalids. And that movement um, actually looks a little bit of that tentacle resembles a snake almost. And that's why I'm pretty sure these have been nicknamed snake arm brittle stars. Let's frame the whole thing. I think we got enough of yeah, there we go. Absolutely beautiful. Oh, you can see the tube. Shifting current, exposing the tube. Roger that. Video, when you are clear, let's come wide. That's cool. I don't know if I've ever seen the tube of one of those yeah, before. Yeah, usually they're pretty well hidden. That's neat to see. Wide. All right, moving on. Thank you. Another primnoid into coming into focus here. And you can see the sediment covers increasing a little bit in the flatter areas of this, arms of this steep out, slope. And, and we're just passing over a stalked crinoid as well as just above us we've got some likely. glass sponges. But they do give us good light. I mean, we don't need to look at it. I was just commenting on it. Don't worry. Thank you. No scale yeah, one. and so the one we collected before was a yellow hyacrinid. And the reason we collected it is because we think that um, it is a new geographic record, a new record for this family being found in the West Atlantic, which is pretty exciting. It's been about eight minutes since that last move. I think you've probably seen it come and go by now. Five minutes on the way down and a three minute move ish. So, probably settling in. Another one of the sea stars looks like it's floating in midair just off to the right, but it in fact is probably eating a coral and we just can't see the coral right now. <laughs> oh, and here we have an absolutely beautiful animal. Yes, please. So this is um, a Cerianthid, so a Cerianthid. Um, and we've seen one very similar to this during the expeditions in the Pacific. And this uh, dark color. You can see the mouth in the middle um, very clearly. Video. A very distinct looking Cerianthid. 
And Saryanthids are tube dwelling anemones. So if we were to zoom in just below, you'd see there was a tube like structure. Oh, really beautiful. All right, that was enough for ID. Uh, Chuck has uh, been talking Long frequently about the Nidaria and and the it. presence of the structures called Nidae, uh, which include nematocysts, these uh, subcellular structures, some of which are used to capture prey by firing. Uh, the Serianthids are unique among the Nidaria in having a type of Nida which uh, they fire, okay. it's, uh, it's, it's folded up Coming and sticky, and they fire it to make their tubes. It basically binds mucus and perhaps some of the uh, sediment and mud particles around it to uh, build the tube. Thanks for that, Scott. Yep. And you can see the very distinctive two rings of tentacles of these anemones the inner one is the inner ring of tentacles is small and dark and curled together in sort of a cone and the outer ring is the large uh, paler tentacles We've had serianthids in the uh, in the lab. If you take them out of their tube, Thanks, they really happy aren't to happy, and will start to uh, begin to reform the tube almost immediately. So I guess the um, the adhesive nidi must be restricted to the uh, to the. Uh, uh, trunk of the anemone and probably are not found in the tentacles. Is that correct? Yeah, that's uh, my presumption, Chuck, although, you know, I, I haven't actually read the details on that, but that certainly seems logical. How are you feeling, co-pilot? 135 this time. Bridge, Nav. RV Nav, Bridge, go ahead. Could we have another ship move, please? And if you look Shipping? at the uh, Sirius Can we do one camera, zero meters? Uh, looking down one, on three, three five two, degrees, you can see the at decimal two knots. Uh, below Bridge it, copy. the one rock meters, structure one is one a, a buttress-like structure. Good copy, Bridge. Thanks. That projects yep, out friend, from the escarpment wall and probably with uh, sediment chutes or gullies uh, to either side. This seems to be a rather characteristic feature of limestone escarpments, whether you're in uh, the west coast of Florida here, in the Bahamas, uh, and uh, probably a number of other places. ROV Nav Bridge, move has been initiated, one zero meters, one three five And the sparsity or Thank scarcity you, of life um, Large life is probably indicative or reflective of got it. the s general Absolutely. slow movement of water adjacent to the bottom. Diva, do you know the uh, name of that sponge? We've seen it before. I can't remember. No, I'm just asking the scientists on shore. Go ahead, video. And as we come around to a slightly more projecting portion of the wall, you see immediately we have more organisms attached. Sponges, octocarl, long glass sponge. Uh, a, on the other projecting uh, wall, we have a pink soft coral and a, um, another glass sponge, stalked glass sponge. And I think that may be the first anthemastus or pseudoanthemastus we've seen of this dive so far. I did not see any earlier in deep water. This is now we're in two, 2,040 meters. Oh, and there's a Munodopsis potentially, Galatheid, just at the top of the screen. Let's go full. 
Oh, was, sorry, full, full now you have better eyes. Oh, there it is. You have better Large eyes than I do. That's a little, a little Galatheid. Yeah, definitely Minodopsis. Yep. ROV nav bridge. That's a complete move. Thank you, bridge. These magnificent stalked sponges appear to be the most common of the large fauna here. So as we're moving further up the slope, um, you can actually begin to see particles of marine snow blowing by, indicating that the current is increasing slightly. And here we've got this wall of different species of glass sponges. You can see there's the very elongated ones, um, as well as stalked ones, and even some smaller, not quite encrusting, but smaller species. There's also a large isidid bamboo coral. And this structure really is just enormous. Uh, Les Watling uh, just checked in with us, um, get a fish mentioning like that a um, the Ascothoracican barnacle may have been uh, something called Thalassomembrasis bayeri, and that's interesting because it's probably named after Frederick Bayer, who was a an octocarls expert and was my professor, my mentor uh, for my master's degree at the University of Miami. And it's interesting. You see these narrow fractures. Uh, running down the slope in the rock. And we were hoping for some rock samples today, but I mean, this kind of terrain, the chance of finding one is very, very slim. Anything that perhaps were to break off would end up very, very far down the slope. Five minutes in, you should probably feel it, the move. Oh, can we have a look at that white spiky thing down on the bottom right, please? Oh, it might be another Coralomore. No, not, not a Coralomorph, not what we were looking at earlier anyway. That's a sponge. I suppose it could sponge be a sponge. I'm trying to remember the name. Uh, like one. Coralomorph was a good guess but initially it. because there in shallower water we have a purple, coral, uh, purple uh, liponema that has tentacles all over it, and it looks like a pom-pom. I'm not sure if you guys heard. I'm pretty sure that's a sponge. Yeah, yes. so, I mean, uh, it is a sponge, but on first It'll glance, we were thinking, what is this, a coralomorph, some type of anemone? Oh, yeah. There were even shouts of a nudibranch or pleurobranch, um, but no, as we've gotten closer, most certainly a sponge. I have no idea what, what sponge, but a sponge. 
Yeah, my, it's just my memory's bad. I can't remember the name, but I'll see if I can dig up the genus name for you. We, uh, so you've, you're have about the, seven uh, minutes in. Northern Atlantic. Ah, well, you've seen it before. Okay. Thank you. North 15. It's like a hedgeho hedgehog sponge. Yeah, that's what I always refer to it as. <laughs> Great minds or fools seldom, you know. Okay. And I believe the term for these long, slender, finger-like um, projections are called fistules on a sponge. And each one, still. or at least the larger ones, are tipped with the um, exit openings, the exhalant openings for the current that the sponge filters through its body. The Inhalant openings are all microscopic. RV Nav and those, uh, you can, can see we them at do the tips. another they move, look please? Like long tubes. Ready when you are. And all right, we'll do an additional one zero meters, meters bearing the one three five degrees at two tenths of a knot. So just part of the Bridge copies one zero meters. Yeah. One that was beautiful degrees, video. Decimal two knots. Good copy. Thank you, Bridge. Yeah, stand by for input. Yep. All right, come on. Should have continued on. So I think this is a great time for us to do a little situation update as well as uh, reintroduce ourselves. We're more than halfway through the benthic portion of this dive, but my name RV is Dee Raymond Bridge, and I'm a research fellow at the Natural meters, History Museum in London. There I work on chemosynthetic habitats, which hopefully we'll be diving on later in the cruise, as well as human impacts on the animals that live within the deep ocean. And this is Chuck Messing. I'm at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. My area of particular ex ex expertise are the crinoids, the sea lilies and feather stars, but I also work on deep sea coral environments and hard deep sea hard substrates. And I love invertebrates in general. And I am Alex Avila. I am a PhD student at Oregon State University in fisheries. And I'm also a Nancy Foster Scholar with the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and an Oregon Sea Grant Fellow. And I'm here to help out with data logging. Uh, sorry, I was muted. And uh, 502 what a help meters she's from D2 um, as of now. So today we are diving on a site that we've yep. dubbed Incised Escarpment Ridge. Just so you know, I don't know if uh, you have a backpack there. We're currently at 2,019 meters. And we're climbing this huge, steep slope um, that's actually featuring these sort of buttress features and our goal for the dive was to explore this area between 2300 and 2000 meters in the northern end of the West Florida escarpment where we are and to look at the geology so that we could try to understand the composition as well as the origin of this area of the Florida escarpment as well as to survey what types of communities are living on these habitats. Um, we expected most of them to be hard substrate communities, and so that would be things like corals and sponges. Go ahead. And here we're passing across another one of these deep grooves in this um, escarpment between the buttresses. So these buttresses are like uh, enormous, flat, enormous knees that project out from the uh, escarpment with grooves between them. And there's a thin drape of uh, sediment that's mostly probably pelagic ooze, the shells of tiny planktonic organisms. You can see the coarser ones yeah, are the yeah. sea butterfly pteropod shells, the little white grains that appear to stand out against the tan background of sediment. RV Nav Bridge, that's a complete move. Thank you, Bridge. And we're crossing over another sediment chute, uh, a depression, a narrow, almost river-like um, depression in the rock face where sediment will pour more readily down the face of the escarpment into deeper water. Here the uh, substrate is a bit more heavily covered with sediment. Perhaps the 
slope is not quite as steep as it was uh, just a few minutes ago. And in the Sirios view, uh, the other camera, you can really see uh, surrounding uh, D2 how steep this um, and rugged this topography is. There's another one of those lovely stalked sponges and a few narrow, um, long narrow sponges and smaller tan ones uh, on the rock face. The tan ones prop may be dead uh, when they take on that color rather than the, the gray color of living sponge in this, these kinds of sponges. Many of them are, are this delicate gray, almost transparent when you zoom in on them. And we're seeing a little bit more uh, um, excavation into the rock wall. Yeah, these, uh, the delicate skeletons of these sponges are web-like on fine structure. And all of these little brown tubes or trees hanging down are uh, agglutinating foraminiferans. They do not have a calcareous test in general, and they glue together fine sediment grains Bearing. over their protoplasm or cytoplasm. Mm, one, four, five. So most of the sponges that we see here are glass sponges, hexactinellida. Uh, it's one of the major branches in the phylum porifera, the sponges. And as the name suggests, hexactinellida means that the uh, Bridge, nav. Some of their fine skeletal spicules Our made bridge, of silica. Uh, another ship move, Our, please. Uh, six sure grade. Yeah. Can we do uh, one zero meters bearing one four five oh. degrees at two tenths of a knot? Sorry about that video. That's negative. <laughs> bridge copies. One zero meters at one four five degrees at decimal two knots. Thank you, Bridge. Yep. Now yep. that is a steep escarpment. And yet there's enough texture to the uh, substrate initiated. that One the sediment does find places to collect. Degrees, decimal two knots. Thank you, Bridge. Yep. Can we zoom in on that little line uh, running down? That is a narrow groove. Back. And it'd just be interesting to see what kind of sediment is uh, running down in there. So that looks like the beginning of a fracture in the rock wall. And there's bits of sediment in it. Uh, and you can see the uh, pteropod or also called fecosome shells of the planktonic uh, gastropod snails, the sea butterflies, collecting in Thank you. various places. Um, there are so a lot of sediment on. drape here, and uh, the very small little um, threads hanging down, some of them branched, are um, 
There's a small octocarl at the bottom left. Um, but the, the very small uh, little brown branches or threads are the agglutinating foraminiferans. Another glass sponge, and here's a little ledge where sediment accumulates. Uh, Bill Keeney has suggested that um, uh, these dark surfaces uh, suggest that there's some kind of uh, cementation going on of a mineral crust over time, whether that has uh, been relatively recent or millions of years old. Um, I don't know. I know on the east coast of Florida, Let's go ahead. similar darkening of the limestone rock uh, has been attributed to um, Miocene or Oligocene age. Let's go for uh, But I'm not sure if the same processes are at work here. And you can see the, diff the distinct difference between the living sponges and the dead ones. The dead ones are tan and uh, probably covered with a fine dusting of sediment and the live ones are pale gray. And here are a couple more uh, uh, sparsely branched uh, octocarls and there, have we seen that one before? No, can we zoom in on that white fan please? There's a couple of them, but the one below center, uh, just to the lower right, the lasers are just about on it. Yes, thank you. And that is an octocarl. Uh, but I'll need help here, folks. Right now, this is looking like a corallian, Chuck, a corallium of some sort. There are a couple of corallium species in the Gulf of Mexico. That's my, my guess from this view. And just at the base of that um, octocoral, you can see two aplicoferans, which are a type of mollusk. They look like little brown worms coiled around well. the base. There's two of them. And they are very unmollusk looking. Um, you can think of a parallel that a sea cucumber looks very unlike a sea star. These look very unlike a snail or a clam, but they do have the radula, the rasping, file like, flexible, tooth bearing uh, structure that uh, is characteristic of the mollusks, although the uh, clams and scallops and other bivalves have lost it. And these, instead of having a solid shell, may have fine skeletal spicules in their um, skin. Yep. And they typically, many of them occur with uh, cnidarians like this. And so uh, Scott mentioned that this is a uh, coralid, a uh, family so. coralidae. This is hops. the family of the precious yeah, corals the and the well before you actually species swim. that's found in the eastern Atlantic and Mediterranean has been uh, harvested for thousands of years for jewelry, uh, for um, religious purposes, even uh, as uh, people thought in ancient times, some kind of medicine. 
Um, the uh, fan coming up in the upper right. precious red coral was supposedly, according to Greek myth, um, when Perseus cut off the head of Medusa, the blood of Med and dropped it along the seashore, the uh, blood of Medusa's head turned the seaweed into what is now the red coral. And there are different species and different strains that can be deep, rich red or salmon, orange or pink. And yeah, of course, as we see here, white. Lots of those long stalked sponges here, many of them dead. There's another corallium and a um, funnel-shaped sponge. Chuck, it's possible oh, we just yeah. passed over yes. a whip. It's possible it may have been a primnoidae whip, something like candidella. Um, so if you come across like upon another whip that's... Uh, Looks like it has fairly dense polyps, especially if they're arising in whirls. How um, uh, how much uh, how much further back was it past uh, to the left of I that? I see it right wanna, now. It's oh yes, to the close up on the center of the screen to the left of that white yeah, band. Yeah, Yes. Sponge. Okay, if pilot, if we can zoom in on that. I think. I think that. No, that's. Um, no. No. No, I think it's a sponge. Well, let's zoom in a little more. It's one of these like ones that look like, you know, you can get a potato and people cut it into like a swirl oh, on yes. a stick. Uh, they one, look four, like those. Five. Yeah, this, this is a glass basket. sponge. <laughs> and there's a little hermit crab on it. <laughs> but we had a... Six six minutes minutes it's six minutes since the end of bamboo, that, so but I, I had no idea it would be a sponge. <laughs> That's a pretty cool looking That's sponge. That's weird, yes. All right, got to go for a little while. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Um, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, I was going to say something about the rock uh, before you sure. zoom away from it. So go ahead. No, please. Uh, the, yeah, well, just kind of a bulbous, small bulbous kind of dark uh, uh, texture of the surface of the rock off uh, suggests closer. to me that that's caused by the growth of that crust, that dark crust, um, uh, sure whether thing. it's ferro manganese or, or what okay but uh so different from some of the other outcrops that we've I'll been looking at for you, this surface looks a little more constructive rather than erosional um on on the fine scale uh you know the processes that go on down here uh you know operate over thousands of years um but in the deep water, it is often that uh, cementation on the surfaces can happen sure uh, relatively this, yeah. rapidly, to the uh, incorporating some of the sediment that accumulates on the surface. So it actually so builds I see the surface two out here. Um, is it the one uh, rather than eroding the front that we're away. Collecting? Now, on a large scale, big blocks and things would fall off. But uh, just on the surface of uh, the scale at which we're looking at, uh, I think we're looking at the uh, back side a, of one. A, a constructive uh, texture. Thanks very much, Bill. We need all of the uh, geological input we can get here. Maybe if you come wide, I'll land. And it, you can see how it varies. We had this uh, deeply. Uh, uh, lumpy surface, and now we have a uh, a narrow uh, layer that's almost a uh, a shelf, and then we go up to a vertical wall where there's almost no sediment accumulation at all, and again you get more of the sponges, but a significant number of them are dead. And there's another corallium, off right. The I'll just add a little bit uh, more about that. Um, in the uh, geologic no, past, in, in fossil so reefs, uh, what's I, um, been described well, as stromatactus, which is a constructive 
material uh, like what we're seeing here, maybe, uh, that grows in the uh, 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 in the framework of, the, uh, of some fossil reefs, particularly in the Paleozoic. And um, so it, okay. there could be some analogy here to that. Mm -hmm. And also yeah, there uh, sure have seen be either, on the Florida we'll Scarlet here at some times some large the looming sponge kind of in the brow is gross, really uh the biggest concern we don't want to be knocking anything off as we get close uh, to cementation um usually on horizontal surfaces uh up on the top yeah of, we can of we will fly up and the shelf laser but uh, yeah. maybe you might see that uh, later on yeah uh, uh, observe and thanks very see. much not a um, if we could sure. zoom in here on that uh, group, uh, oh, well, look at this uh, enormous, uh, beautiful glass sponge up at the top, but just below it, a couple of large, pale orange um, soft corals adjacent to a uh, precious coral. So I'm not seeing anything in the database that really quite matches these sponges, but perhaps they're in the family Farad Faradayid. Faradayidae, no, Farad Fariidae. Fariidae. <laughs> so they would be Faraids. And there's also some Anthemaster soft coral, corallids. Okay. Um, but interestingly, those uh, soft corals yeah, there are the taller currently. than those we've seen. I'm maybe they, uh, uh, this, the here, they've still got that arms, lumpy um, surface so texture, but so maybe they have... And then I can get in close. Uh, grown taller go ahead uh, because they needed to reach out into the current better. It's like uh, we spooked a couple of crinoids and they're, f they're floating. Yep. Uh, Pilot, would you be happy to collect that white fan just below the there? Goes. That corallium? There, I got it. Or at least a part of it. It should be brittle. And interestingly, the... Oh, here we can see a primnoid in front. You can see that because of the dense um, polyps dense arrangement of polyps as well as some serpulids, calcareous serpulids. Well, I don't have altitude lock. As well as these soft corals, yeah, which a um, sponge. there's a little bit of a debate on um, the idea of within the chat room. The crinoid, eh? Upset. Tina Molotsova is one of the experts um, can move on it over this group. Really want it. So we're just waiting to hear what exactly she has to chime in with. Scientists are sure. Um, are these I know it looks like two communities place, different? Why does one have so many more dense polyps than the other one? Um, and if they it's are different, close, do we? Which do we want to collect? That sponge is humongo. Okay, now we're on. So Tina's saying those red soft corals are anthemastus, um, which are very ubiquitous um, in our world's oceans. Well, deep oceans. Okay, can you come in and partial on this video for me? Sure thing. Thanks. How's that? Uh, yeah, that looks good. 
Yeah, okay, I so we're looking for this fan that's sticking uh, out from the wall. And we're trying the to collect lasers the, are from on the right side. A single of fan, as as we can. or a double fan, or okay. Okay. Uh, two separate colonies. Okay. Okay, and we. But I think if we can grab, bright. if you can grab the um, we'll right-hand part of that uh, colony, we don't certainly don't need the entire thing. I don't know how uh, easy that would be. You move the sponge. My auto depth is not. Dropping. Can you give us an estimate of how big that sponge is? I mean, not right now. When, but yeah. That's probably a meter across, yeah. I would say. Ready? All of the branches. Yeah, probably, yeah, probably like a meter. That's a pretty big sponge. And you see things are um, more abundant here on this wall. Even though it's an inner wall, it's probably, exp and maybe, I don't know, I'm throwing out a guess here, that it may be exposed to current pouring out through, uh, down slope from that, uh, that groove behind because everybody is oriented pretty much um, sponge is really perpendicular to flow coming out of that groove. Ideal scenario. No, that's okay. And the vehicle is Okay, yeah. Not. When you're set up pilot, we would like to collect this corralid, which I don't think are two different things. Oscillating on us here. Okay. Brittle, they say. Stop moving. Oh, did we knock something off someplace? Wonder what? Yeah, it looks like crinoid arms. Yes, they do. That's weird. From the, uh, oh, maybe you see in the Sirius. That's the, just a, in front of the ROV is that big, oh, we apparently yeah. knocked off a branch of that big sponge. Well, and it may have had a crinoid on it. So if we <laughs> did collect this corallid, it seems likely that it would be a new record for the West Florida Slope, or perhaps <laughs> a new... <laughs> Or perhaps well, yes, a no, new, yes, no. Or perhaps a new species. Um, mm -hmm. Andrea Quattrini has just told us. This is just breaking with every little touch. We get what we can here. Oh, namely none of it apparently. Oh, I see what you mean now. Maybe once we're done this. That one doesn't have a lid though. So it's not gonna stay there. Jeez. be taking any close-ups. We'll just be getting it to the box as fast as we can. Oh, jeez. Do you want me to come wide on Zeus? Yes, please. I'm going to back off the wall. Easily. Sorry, sponge, jeez. It's of great scientific significance, Sponge, we promise. We're very sorry about that. I 
I'm sure it understands. The white, well, it doesn't really matter. I think it's the same colony, but the white coral that's taking up most of the shot, please. Okay. Yes. Thanks, buddy. Awesome. And we're pretty positive this sinks, so I'll just get it close by here. Yes. I see that. Yeah, for sure. We got an extra sample. I'll try not to mess this one up to add insult to injury. Thanks, buddy. I don't know. Not now that I'm in here, I don't think. Can we do um, the starboard side? Uh, let me pick up a little higher then. You want to go starboard outer? No. Well, I mean, yeah, you can move the drawer in. We might have to scoop some more up here. Shoulder, there we go. I hit the shoulder stop on the mini. Uh, no, uh, I think this is icing here, so if we can get it, we can. If not, then. Trying to keep it nice and close. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. It's just like tissue paper. <laughs> yeah. And then we. Thanks.
Yeah, happy to help. And just so you know, there's still a fair amount of sponge sitting here. So, okay, all right, good. I felt a little bad. <laughs> hey, pilot, before you close the tool tray, um, we've actually collected an extra sample in the rock box. So if we could move that into one of the bio boxes, yeah. that would be great. Thank you. Oh, okay. I like them all the way back, but you can do whatever you like. Yeah. So, Asako and um, Tina are asking whether we could collect one of those broken pieces of sponges. Yeah. Seemed a shame to waste them, but without even, uh, you know, for a ship move. meaning to, we have. Get a short one so, there is a piece Copy. which the so RV pilot uh, is actually five. retrieving from the rock box right now, and that is going to go into one of the bio boxes. Copy. I'll put 10, So, a bumper specimen for us today. RV nav bridge, go ahead. Ready when you are. One zero meters at one four zero degrees at decimal two knots. Bridge copy is one zero meters, one four video, zero degrees at decimal this. two knots. Right. Copy. Oh, stand by for a bit. It's not the partial. Thanks. You can take as much as you'd like. That's full zoom. RVNAV bridge, move has been initiated and one here. zero meters, one four zero degrees at decimal two knots. Good copy, thank you. Thank you. Tilt down to the old fast and the whatever it's holding on to. Full species, and then we can bail when you want to. All right, video is clear. Great, pilot's clear. We're full wide. Thanks. So there's another one right next to this yellow. Actually, snap in on this. There's a fuzziness, like it's open instead of closed. Is it? No, it's just the dirt behind. Okay, off we go. Thanks. Okay, well, we got two samples for the price of one. Um, we just collected a corallid and also a piece of sponge, which we happened to knock off, fell directly into the rock box. So it has now been secured 
in um, one of the bio boxes, have, and we are ready to continue proceeding up slope. Thank you very much, sir. pilots, for those two collections. You. You're welcome. All right, pilots, um, that move just finished. Uh, you'll still swim Oh, we're not bit, worried. Don't worry. Do you want any more? All right, how about 20 meters? No, we can see. It's, it's still I'll pretty keep it at one four zero, sizable. Unless you say otherwise. Yes, I agree. Nav bridge, go ahead. Hey, ready for another move? So we have just over two hours left in the Benthic portion of this dive. Um, but after that, we're going to be doing some midwater exploring. And the midwater is one of the least explored, probably the least explored habitat on our planet. Um, but currently, we are at a depth of 1,970 meters and proceeding up this extremely steep, huge slope. So this is an Iridogorgia chrysogorgid coral, and they are one of my favorite corals. That spiral morphology is just so beautiful. And they do get very, very big. Coming. Yeah. And beyond it looks like uh, possible paramuracea. Nah, bridge. And then can we get a zoom on this pink one? It looks quite small. That might be our first paragorgid or bubblegum right, coral. Copy that. The one right near the lasers, mm -hmm. that little guy. Absolutely, coming in for it. And again, these can get turn into quite big colonies, but this looks quite small. And there's another one on the yellow coral behind. Land, so I'll take advantage of that. Okay, video, come on in. All right. Good That's eye. Not quite full. Thanks. So I'm pretty sure this is a paragorgian. And it looks like it's growing out of the stump of a former colony there. That does not look like, even though it's black, that does not look like rock. And here, Pretty I think all of its polyps are actually yeah. retracted. Yeah. So Excellent. that why it, it, it doesn't look like your typical yeah. octocoral that has all of these beautiful polyps with their tentacles extended. And of course, these ones are called bubblegum corals because of their color. And there's also a sponge and... Serpulid? Uh, or possibly hydroid? or sabellid. Just at the base. Little feather That's duster, great, pilot. Possible. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Video is clear. Pilot's clear. Right. If we could get a full specimen for a second, that would yeah, be great. Of course. And there's a, a couple more, well, one more of the Paragorgiids and uh, another Iridogorgid off to the right. Um, and that yellow coral. There's a nice brittle star at the base. It looks like the Acanthogorgia we saw mm -hmm. much earlier that in the dive. Good. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. And we're full wide. Oh, I see something. Strange. And Andrea's saying that the Paragorgiid, I think she's referring to, is another new record for the West Florida escarpment. She Polyky, only thinks Polyky, that yeah. Sibogorgia has been collected from this depth, and it was much further north in the area known as DeSoto Canyon, where we may be diving a little later in this expedition. You can take a little more if you'd like. Another example of how little is known about many Thanks parts of the deep sea floor. We can't even begin to answer that basic question for most of the deep sea, which is, what actually lives there? That's still partial. Okay. Is that, is that your way of asking for more? <laughs> I think more might be hard to keep up with him, but... Try it out. We can't do it, we can't do it. All right, that's full. Thanks.
So Scott says that he's seen Paragorgia and Sibagorgia on the other side of Florida, um, on the east coast of Florida, a depth, nice. you know, around the Bahamas escarpment to Little Abaco Canyon, located within Bahamian waters. And it's expected that a lot of the um, communities within these areas, the Caribbean as well as the Gulf of Mexico, will have quite a bit of overlap given how the currents in the area are. Yep. But that's why we're exploring these areas and trying to understand a little bit more so that we can begin to answer those kinds of questions. Yeah, it's super close. <laughs> yeah, backing off. And about those currents, the main flow in this area, the primary flow, is part of the loop current, which we've referred to <laughs> before, and you may have heard of uh, it come out? Uh, yeah. previously. Um, so the pattern yeah, is the general overlying Can some over left and right, okay, but when they start going up and down, it's overall exact, pattern it's in the Western Atlantic. <laughs> is that the he just didn't think you had enough of a north equatorial yeah. current <laughs> is RV part of bridge. the what's called the north atlantic gyre yeah, and could we zoom in feet. on that little exactly. uh, flower at the top of that rock i want to see what that is that looks like a f uh, sea lily and it looks Some like something flower <laughs> and it looks like something we haven't seen before it may be the same as we collected a couple of days ago or not. So that is a sea lily. It's in the family Bathycrinidae. And I am not certain, but I'm guessing that it may be the same. Do we have any more zoom on that at all? Uh, that's beautiful photography. Um, difficult to say, but I'm guessing that it's the same thing, even though it's white instead of yellow. It's likely the same uh, as we saw a couple of days ago. I may eat my words eventually, but... Um, I'm not certain. It's certainly a member of the Bathycrinidae. Ooh, there's something coming up. Let's see. Thank you very much. I won't be greedy. Yeah, headed for it. So you can see how this one really is um, concave into the current. The arms are flexed back into the current. This is called a parabolic filtration fan okay. and is taking advantage of the flow across from left to right. Yeah, you can bring a swing arm down for me. Can we get a zoom on this fish, yep. please? We're going to light this up for you a little bit, video. Or, awesome. In the meantime, you can Call zoom in. Keep. Okay. There's the light. That's a partial. Yes, indeed. Oh, That's beautiful. Look at that. Oh, wow. Absolutely wonderful. Is it all right to take more? So that yep. does appear to be a scale worm. That's full. Cool. Thanks. But look at the, the waves of the, the side appendages are called parapodia in segmented worms. And this one has these enormously developed fans of anyway. kitty that yep. it sweeps 
through the water, and you notice that although the power stroke is, of course, front to back, as if you were rowing a boat, but the waves of uh, folding and extension of the parapodia move from posterior to anterior and alternate on either side of the body. All right, pilots, uh, you want to put in another short move? Just to keep and the movement rolling. of the scales, I'm actually pretty surprised by. I didn't think they would be that... Put in like 15 meters. I don't know, fluid? Right. Is the right, right word? Well, I, yeah, uh, they look, certainly look zero? like elytra. They look yeah, like scales. Yeah, they definitely are. But they're transparent. Maybe but this point, though, it has really developed eyes. Five. I mean, it's I got think, some yeah. big black eyes. And that, that suggests that this animal, or red eyes, this animal may be five. more used to living a little further up in the water column, perhaps where there is a little bit more light. Yeah, the only yeah, two uh, well, families yeah, of polychaetes that are one, five, entirely, one, three, five, or, or three, the, seven, the members of the family remain in the plankton Which all the time, are the um, meters, tomopterids one, three, and alciopids. There may be others, two. but this is definitely not Inward. one of them. This is a scale worm, and that was magnificent. Yeah, really great imagery. Thank you, pilots. Uh. Nav bridge. Go ahead, bridge. Move initiated, yeah. one five meters, bearing one three five, speed decimal two knots. Good copy, thank you. You're welcome. Pilots were on the move. Copy that. And coming over the crest of this escarpment to a knee or a shelf. We've got uh, two different kinds of octocarls here, an iridogorgia, and I guess the bushier one is chrysogorgia. This flare is killing me. If the lowers go down or up or something, maybe it'll go away. Not sure what it's off of. A few more octocarls here. There yesterday for a bit too. Can't remember what As we did. come across another fracture, another um, gully Maybe. in the rock. It seems more common to happen. If and the, you can the see there were up. a lot of flimsy branched. Uh, octocorals down in there, probably taking advantage there. of periodic flow down through that gully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take a little now. Zoom glass sponges on there. this rock. Okay. What? Okay, I can't see it that well. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. We're full wide on that. Well, not just a cute. <laughs> uh, so this is most likely a geodeid dema sponge. I'm guessing at the family, but we've seen their like before. I may be wrong about family, but it's a dema sponge, not a hexactinellid. And a couple of solitary cup corals to its right. A small glass sponge and brittle star to its left. And any help I can get, we can get from shore will be greatly appreciated. Thank you, pilots. That's great. Thank you, video.
Some other sponges along the uh, low wall there. And what looks like a feather star on a dead sponge stalk down at the bottom. And coming up another face. with a very tall stalked crinoid. That looks like a hyocrinid again. And oh, there's a beautiful primnoid, sort of a candelabra, and two iridogorgias. There's a lovely little community. There's another stalked crinoid uh, just to the right of that uh, primnoid candelabrum and a few smaller colonies um, of octocorals below. Yeah. That was a nice little community right on a promontory, probably where there's more current flow. Yeah, okay, but now you can start in. Not 100% certain, Chuck, but there may have been an egg case on that Eridogorgia. There was some oh, I uh, missed that. swollen white structure. We'll have to check that in the... ROV that would be my Bridge. guess. Go ahead, Rich. Just in case uh, hey, Scott, you got a last meeting is complete. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Octopus yeah. and egg cases welcome. on some yeah, of these uh, yeah. corals. Okay. Yeah, I seem to remember the Okeano spotted quite a couple Very during quiet. perhaps the Samoa expedition or one of the last few ones um, in the Pacific. But, Scott, did you have an idea what Primnoid that was? Perhaps Clyptrophora? Um, yeah, it's possible we would have had to get a closer look to see the orientation of the polyps and yeah. uh, some idea of the scale. The so right now, because I'm not all that familiar with the Primnode in this part of the Gulf, I'm just going to stick to that family. Great. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, step in just to get an idea of the polyps here. If we want to take a longer look, I can get closer. Taking a longer look. Need a closer look? Okay, stand by video. Let me sneak right. in. That's all right. Just getting a little closer. So we can line it up. That's a partial zoom. Thank you. Ooh, now, Bridge, go ahead. Nip nasty is flying them? around behind you are us. Always ready for them um, in the Sirius camp. Awesome. Great to hear. And this is all a. Right. Sea cucumber one, five, that spends ten, quite a large three, portion three, of its three, life, but not its entire three, life, three, in three, the water column. Move, one five meters, come in a little more. Bearing one three zero, speed decimal two knots. Stand by for input. Yep, an Ipneastes eximia. And they could almost fool you because they do look a bit like Dumbo octopus. Um, at certain angles with that large fringe at the top. But no, not to be. It's ROV now, bridge. Good bridge. Move initiated, one five It's not meters. just a that's right. Thank you, Violet. <laughs> Good copy, thank you. You're welcome. Probably one of the most flamboyant and beautiful sea cucumbers there is. Coming around to another fracture in the rock. Okay. And that Anipniasis is still staying with us in the Sirius cam. Okay. 
some more bamboo corals and acantha gorgeous. But really not the types of communities I was expecting. I thought, you know, it would be hard substrate and very exposed. And so there would be a lot of these big coral colonies, um, quite dense, quite diverse. But that's not really what we're seeing here. Nope. There's a sea star on that ledge face. Can you video when you're clear? I am. All right, I'm clear. And a significant okay. percentage of the sponges that Your we've sponge seen sponge. on these vertical yeah. faces are dead. Um, and it's another indication, perhaps, yeah. that things take place very slowly here because they hang around for who knows how long before right, collapsing, yes, fragmenting, Great. and falling That's off. Full wide. And this is a different kind of sponge. Could we zoom in on that, please? Yeah. That's pretty. This is, I believe, also okay. a glass sponge. With the serious camera, I don't see anything. Oh, this smaller. My sponge scales are pretty limited, so I'm not even going to try. Just below the lasers now, touching the laser, yeah. Okay, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can poke it and find out if you'd like. How are we doing on the Okay, pilots, we're good when you are. Uh, let's see. Looks like it's a. Yeah. Okay. So we might have a couple minutes to swing. Make it quick. Copy. And here we've got another one of these unbranched. Uh, I think I said it. Can we do a snap zoom on that, please, quickly? Or perhaps the primnoid. It looks like it has quite a lot of polyps that are paired. Are we spun up? All spun up? Great. ROV yeah, that's Bridge. definitely a promoted. That last move looks like it's complete. Great. Yes, you. please. You're Sorry. Thanks. <gasps> just adjust. Good force. Nice and done, Diva. Do you have any idea what... Oh, no. Never mind. Um, I know yesterday we were really interested in single that branched like from Noids. There and this. Yeah, so uh, there are a, piece of the wall. Um, a couple Those of different possibilities, and I'm not seeing closely enough yet, but there is something in the Bahamas that we've collected, a Candidella gigantea. And the gigantea refers to enormous sized polyps for primnoid. And you can see that these are uh, quite tall polyps. Um, some of the things that let there us know that we're actually looking at a primnoid coral and not a bamboo here? coral um, are the fact that the polyps have a scale on them. them. Um, and you can kind of see the reflecting white on okay. the, uh, on the sort of transparent body wall of the column. And then the way they're arising from the skeleton, off. they're in this whirl. So it's it's kind of out a little, so I'm sure there will be other opportunities as we go. Off. And then some other characteristics. The skeleton's a little bit different. So this is definitely from Noah Day, and it's the one that I had noted earlier when we looked at that sponge. I thought this is what I was seeing, so kind of nice to uh, see it here also. And again, it is known from the uh, Bahamas Escarpment. Scott, this is really interesting for me because my experience with primnoids has largely been with preserved colonies. And unlike the other octocorals that have the uh, skeletal spicules, uh, generally little narrow things or club-shaped things or dumbbell-shaped things, the primnoids that I've seen, the individual polyps, when they withdraw, are enclosed in can't quite little hear. boxes that are created by plate-like um, uh, spicules, no, some of them with horns and right spines kind of on though. them. 
and I, no I don't, I can't make that out oh, here. Sorry, is this know. one that is somewhat different, or when this these polyps withdraw, would they be enclosed in a little box of plates as well? Right, Chuck. So that's the uh, the squares I was referring to that are kind of like scales. Uh, what I like to compare it to is a suit of armor, and so. Uh, they don't so much retract, and it's not quite a box. It's more like a suit of armor, although it's embedded in the tissue. It's not on the surface of the tissue. It certainly looks like the surface when you're looking at a microscope, but it is under a thin layer of tissue. And uh, these polyps are just somewhat larger. Um, they tend to contract and curl a little bit, so very often they may be kind of facing down or facing up when uh, you look at them, as you say, in a preserved state. Um, but, yep, yeah, that's what they look like when they're alive. Very oh, different from what they look like open. preserved. And typically on those preserved ones, it's the tentacles that are really withdrawn into a ball, so you don't really get to see those well. And instead, those scale-like yeah, sclerites yeah. have kind of formed in a perculum, covering it up. Very good. Uh, Pilot, uh, just off right of the screen, just disappeared to the right of the... Uh, the whip, there looked like there might be a loose rock on the bottom. I couldn't quite tell. Um, maybe just a couple of meters and just a bit down That's from exactly. where you are now. Might almost be directly below the center of the screen. I uh, can't, yeah, right I there. I saw that. I don't know if that uh, one sitting out in the middle of that uh, uh, little area of sediment is loose or not. It looks like it's in right where the lasers are okay. now. Yep. Do we expect this? I, do you want this? It right may just be uh, part of the outcrop. Do you squeeze it pretty hard to make sure it doesn't but crumble? But it or looks just like it. looked like it might be loose. Okay. All right. We won't play that. There's also possibly yeah, one on um, we have time? just pilot. up the slope okay. from there, slightly to the the left, uh, above. Uh, the coral you were just looking at. Uh, we'll check it out. Just see, okay. see if I can. Thank you. Just clear a second. Okay, I'll tilt up and you can zoom. All righty. Thanks, Bill. We're going to check this one out. Critters and creatures. Side's got some something matting over there. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Uh, in the rock box. Looks pretty attached. Yeah. Or in the bio box. Uh, that's solid. Uh, Bill suggested that there just, might be uh, going in the rock box. If you go up the, the slope box. just a little bit, kind of to oh, okay. the, to <laughs> the just said uh, box, right, so we just or sorry, to the left a little bit above the uh, where that coral was. We were looking. That's okay. I just want to make sure I don't do the wrong thing. No, I don't. I don't see it now. What I was looking at, but. Uh, Thanks, so. though. We'll keep an eye out. There'll probably be something more. Arms clear. Off we go. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah. Do you think that's loose? Copy that. Do you think it's too big? 
Yeah, I would agree. Um, All right, I'm just making sure. Uh, one, the coral. two, five. Is it uh, potentially too big or? No, no, yeah. the pilot's uh, more than happy to There's collect another, this. But uh, just to the left of it, there was something crawling by. Yeah. Um, but 15 yes, meters, if we could please one, try and collect five. this rock, that would be there. great. Point two knots oh, coming up. So by collecting this rock, we're going to be able to get this rock accessioned at the Oregon State University, where the public repository is for all of the geology samples that Okeanos Explorer collects. And from there, scientists are going to be able to request it and uh, answer questions about the composition and origin of this area of the West Florida escarpment. So with that, I'll be quiet while the pilots concentrate on collecting this rock. And yes, that is definitely loose. That's fault zoom. Thank you. Nav bridge. Good bridge. We'll get, Move uh, initiated. Uh, one five speed. meters, bearing one two five speed. One decimal two knots. This one size. Good copy. Thank you. You're welcome. Pilots, run a move. Fifteen meters. One two five degrees. Point two knots. Copy that. Thanks. <laughs> oh, no way. <laughs> All right, video is clear. Okay. I'll tilt over to that Arita Gorgia and see if, or scan over to that Arita Gorgia and see if you can come out partially okay. while we search, you know, dizzy people. I know there you're we interested go. in seeing that, maybe. Switching toes. Bump. Um, nope, 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 nope. Don't squeeze it because then it may crumble. <laughs> but if we could just get a good look at it and pop it in the rock box. Yes. That's what we're going for. Come on in. Oh, oh yes. Yep, it is, I'm going to assume, pretty friable. Cool. So just be a little careful with it. Okay, so it looks like there is quite a bit of stuff living on this rock. Stuff is a technical term. <coughs> <laughs> Definitely an encrusting demosponge. How far right are we talking? A juvenile cr stalked crinoid, which oh, Chuck okay. is going to be really happy yeah, about. We'll go over there. Um, and a another type of sponge, she potentially. For yep. that. that looks great. Thank uh, you, pilot. A little more. Some more. There it is. Oh. Yeah, either I like sabella like tubes. Cool. Um, or agglutinated forearms, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, a lot of life on this rock, scan. but this looks great. Yes, please put it in the bio box for us. We don't kick up too much dirt sliding along. Was and that a crinoid bonus? It is. I think of the area, so. Lost my stable footing. It's coming around to this, but we'll get it back. Come back in. That's not quite full. Thank you. Oh, it's a snail. <laughs> oh, what a. Oh, perfect. They just eat, eat an arm and keep going in circles, eating the arms as they grow back. <laughs> Infinite meal. Thank you very much. So our priority for sampling today was actually meant to be geological samples, but given the very steep terrain we've been seeing, um, there haven't nope, been that many yet. loose rocks to pick up. So this is our first rock sample, We're and I know our geologists on shore, William Keeney and Kimberly okay. Galvez, are very happy right, that's to cool. have collected that. Up in front, we've got some more Aridogorgias, um, another type of octocoral, 
Some stalked crinoids. And also there's a tiny sea star. Can we do a snap zoom on it? Just at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, the um ROV nav bridge, that is a complete move. It's a cucumber that covers itself. I'm clear when you are. All right, video is clear. The Ololinius. Sea cucumbers. Or a full wide. This is a pretty little sea star. <laughs> Before now. We'll see what it is when we zoom in. And that is a goniasterid, I believe. It's got those. Uh -oh. Characteristic yes. thick, running low on time. large block like plates we'll that border the disc and arms, and the okay, upper surface is covered a with a field of little flower like spines. You really yeah. have to see them under the Sorts. microscope. They're called paxillae. Yeah. And further. so, all of the members yeah. of this family, of this, nice. uh, the goniasterids and their allies, I th I'm not sure of the names of the other families are in a group of sea stars called the Paxillosida. Little tiny homola. There's a beautiful Iridogorgia. And it looks like it's got a commensal squat lobster yeah, in it. Go ahead, I'm as well as, can we quickly zoom on that green zoom. within the Iridogorgia? That He's could so be an so. old egg capsule where the animal has already hatched. Yes, that's definitely what that is. So this I could think be... There may be another one on the colony to the right. Yeah, I just saw that, Scott. So this could be um, something like an octopus egg, which was laid here on this Iridogorgia. But if we were to pan right, there is a stalked crinoid, and I think there is another one of these capsule-type things on it. Uh, not very far, like a foot. Maybe a little more than a foot. There we go. You can snap on the way by for sure. Yep. So that one. Okay, video snap in on this. Yep. This looks like another high. Well, I'll have to zoom in on that. It's got something attached to it. There are some snails that feed on these guys. We think this may be an octopus egg, given that. Oh, no, oh, it's yeah. a gastropod. It is a gastropod, and this is a bathycrinid, yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah, then. Uh, well, yes, I think yeah. so. Uh, it shows uh, some considerable arm regeneration here. And I imagine... Okay. Uh, oh, yes, I see it. <laughs> Would you like the tunicate? Absolutely. And uh, so I'm expecting that this bit. snail has probably stuck its proboscis around into the anal opening of the, uh, of the crinoid. That's one possibility. But you can see crinoids are experts okay, okay, at regeneration, okay. as are brittle stars and many sea stars. That's a partial. And uh, especially the two arms, the pair of arms at... Uh, Midnight at noon and uh, 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock are much smaller and regenerating. 
but I'm not sure what kind of snail that is. Go further if you have it. So Les Watling from the University of Hawaii has just chimed in the chat. That coral we were looking at before this is um, Iridogorgias splendens, and the shrimp living inside of it is likely from the from the species Ceratopalma, B. Ceratopalma, and that case which we saw on it, which is open, is probably the egg case of a Dumbo octopus. So if only we were a little bit earlier, I have no idea how much earlier, but <laughs> that may have been there for quite some time. Um, but yeah, it's likely that a Dumbo octopus came out of that, so they are around. So there's something scuttling along the sea floor just below the lasers. like a bamboo coral and then maybe a Chrysogorgia. Oh, there's a, uh, that looks like a, uh, perhaps a, uh, one of the decorator crabs or a homola. Homola that I can't quite make out. It looks like it's carrying a little bit of sponge. You good video? And yep. that's what I'm homolids good. do. Right. Full but its legs also appear to be uh, festooned with uh, debris like decorator crabs. Yeah, but you should be at a swing right now. And I just did some checking on the World uh, Register of Marine Species and I um, apparently got wrong the um, uh, placement of the goniasteridae yep. uh, belongs apparently, according to the worms, uh, in a different major group of okay, sea stars started. called Valvatida. Thank you, pilot. Yeah, and you can see there's this crust. Um, more of this, perhaps, ferromanganese crust on the carbonate. Here we've got a black coral, Stichopathes, the orange one, as well as that unbranched primnoid, the white whip, just about, about to go off. And before that, there was dog. potentially the acanthogorgia. <laughs> what is this stalk with, it may be a dead sponge with lots of animals on it. Thank you. Dead sponge stock with perhaps some live sponge on it, as well as some other things, other animals. Of course. <laughs> Video, would you like any shots before we go? Um, I think I think we're probably good. Okay. okay. Off we go then. Co-pilot, ready for another move? Uh, what direction ahead. do you want to keep? Last one's 125. This dark object over here is. Copy. I'll do another one at 125. Unless you want to adjust. 120. And here we've got another. Ooh, there's a tunicate down. Just about to go off screen. Clay. 20115. Yes, please. Can we zoom? 20110. Two zero one one zero. Nav bridge, go ahead, sir. Hey, ready for another move? Yes, we are. All right, two zero meters at one one zero degrees at decimal two knots. Bridge copies. Next move, two zero meters. So this is uh, either likely decopia or megalodecopia, but it is a 
predatory tunicate, and you can see it's got this very it's large open here. mouth uh, facing downwards. And Come they really are just one of the strangest deep sea animals. They kind of look like Pac-Man <laughs> a little bit. And this is another example of how evolution can take really bizarre Nair twists bridge. because the vast majority Nair of tunicates or sea yes. squirts are suspension one, two, feeders or filter feeders on very Copy. small suspended particles, just as sponges are. But just as uh, yes, one family of sponges, the Clatterizidae, has become carnivorous on larger prey, so a few tunicates have also become fish. carnivorous on larger prey, and there is even grass. a family of bivalve mollusks that has Go become carnivorous and cool. will suck in small <laughs> crustaceans <laughs> as right. well. So you just saw his mm. mouth, in inverted commas, <laughs> close. So perhaps the bow okay. wave of D2 funnels some food into its mouth for it. Very superficially, this, uh, the front end of this tunicate, which is stalked, it's attached to the sea floor, looks also sort of like the front end of a, one of the comb jellies. Comb jellies, of course, normally have those long adhesive tentacles, but there's one group of comb jellies called the baroids that are carnivorous, and the whole front end of their tube-like body opens up and will swallow other tenophores. So I was referring to the opening at the front of the mouth. That, of course, is incorrect. Um, that is likely the incurrent siphon, which does appear as if, a, as if it's a smiling mouth. Whereas before, you should have been able to see the incurrent siphon, which was on top and appears uh, as a circular structure when vo viewed from above and is much, much smaller than that very large incurrent siphon, the expansive one. Reminds me when we chased one of those downhill once, thinking it was a... Yeah. A Can we do a snap zoom on the sea cucumber, please? I actually... I've heard the story, but I don't remember that. I remember uh, it happening. Mr. Wright was pilot. Went chasing after it. Venturing to the steeper section to see what it looks like. This looks like it's pretty steep. Look well, I don't here. know what that one is. So this is from the family Cinelac today. Um, this looks I'm like guessing like that because of here. the projections. Really over there. Ooh. And uh, my sonar is picking up. Where's he going? Uh, a couple little things, maybe. Is he going to lift off? Maybe, maybe. Is he doing some distance, yoga? I might visually <laughs> be seeing some outcrops, but they look like out, you know, some just, <laughs> just that outcrops. Actually, wow, Jeff, you this. know it. I'm like flying right over to something. Ooh, is that something you want to check? Well, we could take a. That is the front right end. It looks like and, uh, sticking up wood. Yeah, I'm here. not quite sure of an ID pass in a lack today, but. Come on in. Those oh, numerous projections um, on the a boral surface make me think yeah. that. That's beautiful. Thank you very much, pilot. Probably let it swim away and. <laughs> Thanks, video. No problem. You want to follow me over for a second? I'll take a glance around this edge here. Take yeah, pilot. Next move, I can uh, cater the ship more towards that direction. Yeah, so this is the one that rock outcrop. You can There's see we're leaving a, here, and a really go gorgeous splendid with the same bathy paymanella. Um, shrimp living commensally. Yep. And I have to own up to an error. We'll move, uh, the right goniasterids that we've seen, Copy. the little move Cuban cracker type sea stars, and start then, doing it. Uh, uh, they're uh, interlocking um, uh, polygonal on the side of the spines ridge. on yeah. the back. Okay. Uh, Copy that, plates actually. are not paxilli. They're a different kind okay, of yeah, spine. So I uh, have to correct myself. Uh, I didn't have Chris Ma to smack me around when I first mentioned that a couple to, of days um, ago. So start with apologies. 30 meters? Yep. Copy. I should stick to crinoids. 20. 20. Should be sufficient to get right on that ridge. 20 due east. Coming up. 
All right, we're going to take a little peek down here. I don't want to go too far given our Sirius D2 orientation right now, but we are getting Sirius over here to make it more. Yeah, we are coming channel. up out of the extremely steep area and Great. moving into a much shallower uh, slope. Well, in more than one way that's meant. Shallower is in depth and also shallower is in um, um, to go around further, but gradient. Get it from the back uh, end here. But could we zoom out so on iPad for a second, uphill, please, now? So um, just, so just so I can see where, just so I can see where waypoint two is. Ah, uh, okay. I only got a minute or two here before I got to run off. <laughs> so it's a partial. Our VNAV bridge move has been initiated two zero meters at zero nine zero degrees. That's a blade of Thalassia seagrass that has drifted down from Going above. A bit further. Just feeling a little bounce from Sirius, <laughs> so we'll try to counter that. A Need some bit. tether? That's okay. I don't want you to be unsafe. I mean, I'll lose you and just point towards the wall or towards the slope. That's all right. We got the ID. We can't get around to the front to get a cool shot anyways, I don't think, so. I think that's good video. All right. Thanks. Um, Sorry. So, I stretched out right now we're beginning to climb a ridge-like um, feature. Push up um, but on track. either side of us, there are steeper um, slopes. We'll come back to this. Uh, this Scientists uh, and stakeholders at home, um, how do you feel? Do you want to continue on this um, sedimented uh, ridge where we um, could see sample. a different set yeah. of animals or <laughs> do you want to consider sticking to the two All steep right, up. slopes on either side of us where the there's probably going to be a lot more hard substrate. Yes. I go for the we hard substrate. For that <laughs> you're biased. <laughs> are, we ready or are we waiting for something to complete first? Uh, no, you're moving east. Okay, cool. Oh, look at this. I have, we have this like high in between us. <laughs> so it's it's more even further off uh, to your port side, huh? Yeah, it looks like it's more yeah. hard substrate that way. Thanks very much, pilot. That way. A little out of reach at the moment. But we'll That's true. That. It may all be sedimented. Sort of in which clean. case, it wouldn't really be an issue. See something tallish out there, or maybe that's just more. Yeah, this is sort of like a gully or something. And then all that. Oh yeah. Base over there. Yeah. Sonar's got it pretty much. Yep. There's something in the east. water column over there. Headed, right? It might just be a yeah, new east. I'll bring me a little bit above it so our next one, Sean, we might want to do zero eight zero. Copy that. Keep but there is hard bottom dead ahead. You in the wall. But that's down slope. Well, down slope. slope a bit. Yeah. It looks yeah, like that's we're in above the nasties. I think due east is probably fine a little bit further. This is seven five that I'm looking at right now. Yeah, I think we've probably filmed the nasties, you know, in between all of the Okeanos yeah, Explorer expeditions. To death. So we're just trying to get our yeah. bearings. Well, they're always beautiful to look at, yeah. but we've seen it already today. Is that a ravine, though, to follow up? This? Yeah. We could, yeah. I don't know if we want to. I mean, that's sounds like there's a little bit of... Yeah, and so scientists are saying um, so they'd prefer to try to stick in the steeper areas just in case there is hard substrate. So if we could continue going um, up like this steeper area, please. Wherever steep and go. Up it, which is sort of out this way. Well, that just might be a one ledge and then it flattens. That sounds great on our end, Sean. Yeah. I, don't see any I was just saying that sounds great. Any, uh, All right, I'm gonna come back over your way. How are you looking? 
Uh, pilots, uh, looks like that move just finished. When we tack on another 15 or so, I would do 15 at 75. 15, 75. Get me kind of over there because I think we want to go as you were pointing, like one, two, zero. Okay. Yeah, this is just to move you in front of the yeah, slope. And sorry, that was meant for pilot. Oh, way, sorry. Yeah. The way he was pointing. Copy. I'll put in 15, zero, seven, five. But we want to go. Wait a minute. Zero, seven, five. We don't want to. We don't want to go north, do we? We want to go any further north? I would think that I want to come so where you are, and then where we you want are to head off. And then rotate. Yeah, and then slope. rotate, oh, and you're going to head. Well, we can cut it, too. Yeah. I was thinking you're going to be further away as opposed to coming back Ooh, onto this hill. Ooh, look at this guy. Whatever you want, Parley. That is a lithoded crab. I think we should, for the, for it the is not time, a true crab. It is still it. more closely yeah, related to, to the hermit I crab. Head off because more to left side of as we get closer, you'll see it has three pair of walking legs then rather then than four. I'm not sure of the genus, so possibly neolithodes, uh, but I haven't kept track. Or so I don't know if any change has been made. We're looking at its hind end. 9.5. One yeah. five meters, nine five degrees. Just to get them out in this section so we can go uphill. Or if you have bridge, go ahead. Towards you. Sure am. Push out that way. One five meters at zero nine five degrees at decimal two knots. Bridge copies one five meters at zero nine five degrees, decimal two knots. Good copy. That Stand sounds great, foot. thank you, pilot. RFNAV bridge, move has been initiated. One five meters, zero nine five degrees, at decimal two knots. Good copy, thank you, bridge. Thank you. All right, pilots, this is your navigator with a quick update. Um, yep. Currently moving one five meters at zero nine five degrees, decimal two knots. Roger that. Okay, so this this whole mound seems look. Okay. Watch the pilot. This whole mound at this point seems sort of sediment topped. So right, yeah, you know, as the geology here is so dramatic. Yeah. Um, so do you know, do you want us to sort of buggy east along to try to get out here and maybe move sidle along the slope some, or do you want to try to make it up to the top of this thing? Because we can, there probably is more hard substrate if we just keep going east. Um, but you're not really making much depth um, progress at that point. Well, we've come around the northern part of this uh, crest and hope that it's a little bit steeper and we'll try to stick to that side. Um, but it might be still sediment covered. That move. A couple meters left. Okay. I think you're swinging. I know. A couple minutes of swing, I would think. You can frame the shrimp. Right. As long as she's talking about it. <laughs> that spider crab, that uh, king Some crab, or uh, 10 bright red spiny crab, may have been Neolithodes grimaldii, which is found. Uh, 
across the North Atlantic and has been reported from the Gulf of Mexico before. Uh, as I mentioned, the um, lithoded crabs are related to the hermit crabs. Yeah, of course. Cool. And they are not true crabs. There's something you want to look there at are in some uh, areas in. where species of like lithodids sort of are harvested commercially. In general. Shrimp don't get enough time in the light. There's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> they don't really have eyelids, do they? They don't have eyelids. Can't close their eyes. Can they? So currently we are at a depth of 1,898 so. <laughs> meters at a site known as Incised Escarpment okay. Ridge. <laughs> I know that's funny to you, but... We are exploring some very pronounced promontory yeah. features. I was just... You um, said he was blind, which so are very close his eyes, steep and uh, we thought would be very exposed. Um, so we were expecting a lot of hard substrate, which would mean that we could... Exactly. Yeah. Video's good. Okay. Get to understand Thanks. a little bit more about the origin the and... What's that? Composition we're of the of the sea floor in this area <laughs> Not my <day> to watch. <laughs> of the West Florida Escarpment Ridge, but um, we have yes, actually found a lot more sediment than we were expecting, yeah, yeah. which means that we've um, seen so both hard gonna, substrate communities um, and soft substrate oh, communities. Sorry, I'm yelling in your ear. We have about an hour um, left, and then we're going to begin exploring the midwater. We're going to try well, to stay to the northern about a half an hour after that, we're going to leave okay. the seafloor, so journey up to 1,000 you know, meters depth, might, and then begin exploring sort of 10, the midwater. So the we hill. still have about two and a bit yeah. hours, uh -huh. three hours uh, left in this dive. still want to make it to the top, but they don't want to um, go up the shallow But we only got like a, another hour before we leave the bottom for yeah. midwater, though, right? Yeah. No, we have an hour left on the bottom, and about three hours left of the science portion of this dive which will include the midwater transects. So our ROV pilots are about to do a shift change. And once they are settled in, we'll get them to introduce themselves again. Go ahead, pilot. I'm, I mean, I think you're right. We're gonna we're leaving the very steep areas and we're going into um, a much shallow gradiented slope. So John, you staying on for nav, or did you just come in, or somebody else for a place in here? Uh, let me get back uh, to is, you. There's not a move in right now, though, right? Okay. Okay. Right, yeah, so I think right. um, while we do want to see the hard substrate, I think it's probably okay. more important Special. to see the variation yeah, in the right. substrate Something. with Something that in there. So, so if we can continue there. towards waypoint two, or generally to the the crest of the um, this ridge-like feature, please. The antenna coming out. That sounds great. Trying. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, trying to get set up here to do that. Come out just a little bit on the camera. Yeah. No. How's that? Back so, in a bit. Right, right in front of us is likely a shrimp from the genus Nematocrosinus, and we've seen quite a couple of these during this uh, expedition the so in. far. Yeah, you can. They do, do that. tend right. to be. Yeah. found on, on soft sediment habitats and uh, you can see they've got extremely long legs the as well connect. as 
um, antennae. The antennae are used as in a sensory yeah, capacity, uh, whereas the legs are the very well comes. adapted to walking <laughs> on this <laughs> come out. very right, heavily I'm sedimented bring the port area. Upper around a little bit, perhaps. Port upper. They are probably one of the easiest shrimp to identify to genus yeah, like or family because right of those Maybe. very characteristic legs as well as the, the exact shape of the body. Yeah, that didn't help any, did it? Keep bringing it in. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's well, a this tough one's blind angle. now. <laughs> they don't what? I don't think any invertebrates have eyelids. Or any, most groups of animals no. I don't think have eyelids. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't change it at all. The only thing you can do is the lower swing arm. Yeah. Thank you for generating conversation, okay, Jeff. Let me bring <laughs> that just inboard a little bit. I think I see a claw. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the animals that live down here, of course, never see light. Um, this deep oh, down in the so ocean is yep. completely yeah, devoid showing, of any yeah. light, apart yeah. from perhaps bioluminescence generated by animals. So <laughs> our <laughs> ROVs do uh, you can bring that upward. Yeah, shock okay. a lot of these animals. Um, they come wide? and potentially blind them temporarily oh, or permanently. But not met that many of the animals down here actually do have eyes, so it's not that much of an issue. Okay. Oh, there's quite a big burrow there. Can we do a snap zoom when you switch over, please? Some rock there. Hey, come on in video. That's a nice, smooth, straight burrow. It looks like there's a pair of antennae sticking yeah, out of it. Yeah, something is moving around in there. Can't tell what that is. It looks pretty big. Do we have the, uh, come out wide, please? Do we have the ship moving, Levi? Uh, move just completed, it looks like. Sounds like you'd like another one. Uh, Not sure what, yeah, we're talking about what the resident is there. there. Steeper. Any chance we yeah. could uh, Come around there. change the angle, yeah. get some light in there? Someone like uh, nine zero or? Hey pilot, any sure. chance we could get Kay. a better look in? Down your kid is twenty meters at zero nine zero. Or do yep. you help? That's no, that's good. Yeah. Sound what you want there? Yeah, that's fine. Great. Bridge, RV Nav. Nav bridge, go ahead, sir. Uh, yeah, we'd like to move uh, two zero so meters, bearing zero nine right. zero degrees, speed decimal two. 
So that's about a four centimeter across borrow, which is two inches. Decimal two knots. Good copy. Stand by for Almost two inches. Somebody's in, in there. On the Looks like a shrimp, perhaps. Could be. Smart to shine the laser in there. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. ROV nav. We bridge. can say definitely arthropod. Good. Move initiated two zero meters bearing zero nine. Probably zero decapod. Good copy. Thanks, Bridge. You're welcome. If you can see the back row right now, both Chuck and I are like craned over, <laughs> staring at the screen, hoping for a better glimpse. Oh, what is that? Can't quite tell. But shrimp is a good... Or oh, squat lobster, good. maybe? Well, they're unlikely to burrow. I know they've made uh, craters. Hmm. The only other thing I can think of that doesn't... No, doesn't match was... Uh, some of the big polychaetes, but that, no, those No, there's like, definitely um, legs yeah, in there. There's legs in there, yeah. Yeah, and I think I can see a claw as well. So that's why maybe sh maybe some kind of crab? Well, there is a, um, there are Crabs. small burrowing lobsters. Okay, well, thank you for partially solving that mystery pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Come down a little bit, down. Copy that. Oh, and you can see the other end of the burrow. Oh yes, on, yep. further up the hill. Full wide. Come on in, video. Not so partial. Come on in. So at the beginning of the dive, we started in a habitat very similar to this, um, more of a gentler sloping slope. Um, but now we have moved. Can we get a zoom on that? We then moved further upslope and came across some much steeper areas that were hard exposed substrate and now that looks like a dead sponge stalk with another sponge living on it and some other commensals a brittle star and some other little animals um, and now we've moved back over the crest of that really steep area and um, back into the sedimented terrain Okay, onwards and upwards, please. Oops, some more hot substrate. Here we've got some more glass sponges. They're the blue-white animals, um, various different types. There's some encrusting ones lower down on the rocks. And then also an isidid, I think. I think so. But some of it looks like it's been eaten. Um, you can see the skeleton's a little exposed, unless that's something else in there. All right. but 
are full wide. So yes. that um, that sponge on the right may be a small Afrocalistes. Small uh, serpulid worm tubes, the white worm tubes, and uh, oh, are those still on Ephra? No, I think it's on a skeleton. No, well, it could be. I don't know. Scott, are you there? By what I'm looking at here, there's a barnacle over left on that skeleton. Uh, also, not a gooseneck. Come on so, um, actually, I think this is, uh, check what I sent you that email about. This may be the cornularid. The, uh, in, the sort of encrusting uh, stoloniferin, is that yeah, right? Uh, exactly. So it grows as a stoloniferin, which means it's growing as a ribbon. It has a membrane that polyps arise from. Um, so that's generally called Go ahead. Uh, I don't know if I called you, but... but uh, move complete. Thanks, Bridge. Roger. The the uh, ship just completed the booth pilots. And, um, Copy a that. little capsule at the base of the polyp. And it's, uh, it's chitin, so it's the same sort of material that makes up the exoskeleton of the shrimp and crab, the same basic uh, molecule. Um, and it's common also to hydroids. So it, that's the only octopole family that does that. And it's kind of the appearance of what I'm looking at. Very interesting. So Thanks. Overgrowing an existing skeleton of something else. All right, thanks, video. Thanks, pilot. There's another sparsely branched colony up in uh, up top center there, which I'm guessing is an isidid, but not sure if we could have a snap zoom on that. Some of that is also dead some of those branches. And Scott, what do you think here? Sorry, I turned my eyes. I was making a notation on that cornularid in the database. Yeah, this is a bamboo coral. So um, I noted earlier that there are several different species that grow in what we call these brambles. They have these really tiny skeletons, and there's no clearly definable pattern to the branching. So it's not a fan, it's not a whip, it's not a candelabra, instead it's this kind of confused mess. Um, and I don't know that there's ever two that are exactly the same, which suggests that they're responding to local conditions in the hydrodynamics, perhaps, as they grow. Um, we need to learn that, a lot more about that, that. Yeah, um, that's Max. It could belong to one of two clades, so what we call our J clade, and it gets that name because the up. genus Jasonisis is included in there. I'm not saying this is Jasonisis, but that is one other group. Full wide. Um, but there's also members of the uh, Caratoisis clade that grow like this, and uh, the S1 clade. So it's very confusing and really hard to determine from this view. Thanks very much. Um, that barnacle that was on the previous one, uh, Bob Carney mentioned, Shall is a verrucomorph barnacle, which okay. is different from Let's the typical uh, intertidal uh, barnacles that you get on rocks at the seashore, the balanomorphs, and also different from the gooseneck barnacles as well. Remarkably delicate, this bamboo coral. Oh, indeed. Let's do a snap in here. Okay. One thing that's actually interesting from this view that we're looking at, um, as they grow, as they age, typically for okay. most of them, the skeletons will get thicker. Much like as a tree grows, you know, it's putting down additional rings, and so the skeleton has done the same. But the polyp sizes never change, and so that may be one of the reasons why these polyps look so large relative to the skeleton, because the axial growth of the skeleton is relatively recent. And yeah, you can see as you sort of pan down there, the skeleton's getting a little bit thicker, and I suspect near the base of the colony, you'd see it the thickest. So if this continues to grow in the decades ahead, presumably that skeleton would increase in diameter. Understood. Yep, can see that. Thanks very much, oh, Scott. Right. Thanks, Pilot. Thanks, Video. I'm going to 
head up slope. And uh, up to our right looks like a different kind of glass sponge. It's off right. Uh, another stalked one. This is similar to the hyalinema type sponge we saw earlier, but the body of the sponge is much larger in proportion to the stalk than the other one, which had a much longer stalk and a relatively smaller body. And a couple of brittle stars on the stalk. Come in on the primnoid. And this looks like a great big goblet. And you can see it also has colonial anemones in it. Those pale orange polyps sticking out of the openings in the skeleton. That's false. Also, it appears, I think, you see that... Um, um, I don't know what you want to call it, the um, almost, not webbing, but the uh, strands and, and meshes of yellow um, particles that are covering the sponge, particularly you can see it on the side where the surface of the sponge runs away from you. Those are all particles, I think, that have, the sponge has, in its inhalant current, has pulled against it, but those particles are too large to get into the interior canals of the sponge. And so they coat the outside surface. There's a nice mycid opossum shrimp. And uh, I remember one of my colleagues who works on brittle stars, Gordon Hendler from the Los Angeles County Muse Na Museum of Natural History, did some neat, many years ago, did some neat uh, time-lapse photography of a sponge in shallow water, one of the shallow water reef tube sponges. And uh, during the uh, series of tidal cycles, the sponge would um, pull in the water to feed, and large particles would get, uh, would collect on the outside oh, and I probably see. clog it somewhat. And um, at a different stage of the tide, brittle stars that lived inside the sponge would climb out and feed and uh, clean off all of the detritus oh, on the outside here? of the sponge. So it was a nice, nice mutual relationship. Far left. So I don't know whether these brittle stars will climb up and um, sift Fuck. these particles off the surface or not. But uh, it's Maybe happened it's elsewhere. Yeah. And these, Looks again, like look like members of the family Ophiocanthidae. Come on in, video. Great shots. Yeah, I just oh, yeah. love okay. seeing those uh, bundles of the uh, silicious spicules extending down into the sediment. And I don't know if we've said it already sometime during this expedition, but there have been okay, in studies tight. by material scientists of the properties of those spicules for him. transmitting light, uh, basically to compare and determine how we can better um, manufacture fiber optic cables. Right, yeah, I've heard about that too. It really is hard to believe that, you know, nature created that. It just is absolutely incredible. They do actually look just like little glass strands. Yeah, I think that might be an urchin okay, down there. Uh, frame it up. Oh no, one of those. Um, A polymastia, polymastia sponge. The word there we before. go. Thanks, Scott. And Diva, that's uh, when you when you look at something as extreme as that stalk glass sponge. That's exactly uh, a, a thought that occurs. How could something like this have? Um, you know, it's amazing. And yet, um, for example, if you look at the Euplectella, those narrow tubular gray glass sponges. At the base of them, they also have um, fine needle-like or thread-like glass uh, uh, glass threads, glass spicules oh, that they anchor, but they're much, much smaller. 
And so there are intermediate stages for uh, many of these things uh, among the different species that it's, um, it's not just something that popped out of nowhere, yeah, but there's uh, one uh, sponge will have slightly stopped. longer needles and, uh, and then uh, as part of its lattice work and another one yeah. will yeah. develop yeah, 20 or more. slightly longer uh, ones 20 as part of its right. anchoring and then um, you have a Pretty genetic right switch, now. for example, that doesn't turn bridge, off and yeah, just like a move, builds uh, same as last. two zero meters of the fuel. Zero nine zero zero view pilot. You see that black of there? I think the, uh, it's just a crack. Diversity yeah. of uh, the bottom, but it looks dark like a line, though, too. Do you think there might be a line? No, I'm just saying I think that's probably and is that the bottom, a but it... Sure yeah, looks so that looks like another one of the primnoids, okay. which yeah. you I said looks like the candelabra. Yeah. Perhaps from the genus Calyptrophora, but we'd need to get some really, really, really good shots to be able to determine that. Don't bother to try, but this is a Uralid. Yes, a snake star, Astroschema, or Astroschematidae. One of the uh, brittle stars that uh, typically you Copy find you. coiled up in the branches of octocorals. It's uh, rather fleshier than uh, some of the others that we've seen. Sorry, Chuck. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think uh, Primnoa might be the genus Norella. Uh, so earlier, okay. Chuck, you were saying you couldn't really see the scales. Yep. You can see on these polyps quite clearly That's there cool. appear to be white rings. And those white rings are the edges of these scale-like um, sclerites. And one of the ways you can distinguish the genera are by counting the number of those scales from the base towards the tentacles. And then another is whether the tentacles appear to be facing downwards or upwards. So it's possible that uh, this is uh, the genus Norella, but you know, that's just a guess. Thanks, Scott. Wonderful, thank you, pilots. So that's the first one of those, I believe, that we've seen. No, yeah, when you were at lunch, we saw one. Oh, all yeah. right. Missed it. Okay. Josh, I think you need to come back towards the center yeah. when you yeah. can. I'm coming back up. More full wide. Uh, a young Anipniastes, almost transparent, just drifted by the uh, screen. This is a different kind of sponge. Uh, lovely sort of folded funnel. I am guessing glass sponge. And a little hermit crab out there on the rim. That's beautiful. Thank you. You really do have to wonder what is the reason for all of these different morphologies of sponges. It's like why the need for such a you know, variety of shapes? It's a tough one. It's uh, in it's many cases, I think it's yep. um, different answers to the same question. So like niche partitioning like almost. Well, not necessarily niche I've partitioning. Seen. I don't think there's enough uh, crowding for competition here to worry about, well, I'm going to feed differently than you do. I think it's different ways of growing up Our to move is complete. Move complete. capture Thanks, particles from the passing like water. The, just completed that the end result is okay. the same. You're capturing the same kind of particles. I think most of these sponges feed on the same size range of particles. 
but because of their evolutionary like history, their genetic makeup, coal. they grow in different ways and end up doing the same sort of thing, reaching out into the water column to extract Sponge. particles. We've got another one of those large branching uh, hexactinellid sponges here with another crinoid on it. Uh, if we could take a quick look at that. Did we ever get a name for this genus of sponges? Okay. They also look like there are chrysogorgiids on that edge. And that's another example of how suspension feeding organisms con concentrate on the promontories, on the uh, portions of the escarpment that stick furthest out into the water column. So yeah, we did get, an, uh, well, at least a family for that big sponge, um, perhaps Phoreidae. And then just above that, you can see, we're, well, we're going to take a, qu a closer look at the crinoid, obviously, for Chuck. Um, but then above that, we've got a couple more colonies of coral, definitely an Aridogorgia, um, yep. also perhaps an Isidid. That's what Ooh, right. That does not look, look like it's in good condition. Well, it may have been chewed up a little, if we can get a little closer. Um, I think it's just that some of the pinules near the bases of the arms are folded down against the arms. Uh. And uh, this pale yellow color is typical of many deep water crinoids. And this is most likely Crinometra brevipinna, um, which is widespread in the Western Atlantic. Um, it has the characteristic yellow color, uh, more than 10 arms, and the hooks um, that it holds on with are a bit on the long side for this genus, but this is one of the taxonomic problem children of crinoids <laughs> in the Western Atlantic because over 20 different sculptural no, varieties have been described. Turn more there to starboard, or is there an base near good. the bases of the arms? Now in it particular, still looks pretty good. Okay. There are knobs, bumps, spines, or smooth ones, or ones with little leafy-like projections, and um, that's one of the projects for my retirement. You look like you're ready for a move. Yeah. It's got a wide depth range, uh, I'll do the and I'm pretty years. sure we sure. have a distinctly yeah, different species. Good in substantially yeah. shallower Ten. water, uh, it tends down. to be smoother in less than RB 200 down, meters. Uh, yeah, we'd like and to move uh, two zero meters, bearing zero nine zero well, speed Well, it, it's interesting. Too. They're, they're of copy. course, um, two zero between 80 and 90 zero percent zero calcium carbonate. Um, but in deeper water, there are, there are a couple of wonderful records from a, um, an expedition with an ROV to some seamounts off Antarctica that found uh, those uh, uh, species of that yellow hyocrinid, the similar one that we collected earlier today, was being preyed on by both uh, a sea star and a sea urchin. And then uh, in shallower water over in the Bahamas, there are other crinoids, which I was kind of hoping to see, not this deep necessarily, but they bridge. have hooks Move along their stalks, and they can actually zero unhook, zero lie down, and Move crawl around, good copy. and they Thanks are preyed variety. upon by some of the pencil urchins. There are records of some fishes in shallow water on the Pacific reefs nibbling at crinoid arms. We see regeneration, but it's not clear whether they are really going after the crinoid or the one of the many commensals, the little shrimps and worms and actually tiny little squat lobsters and other things that live on the crinoids. Uh, but they may be taking the arms as well to feed on. So even though they're Just crunchy. Earlier this year when we were on our cruise from American Samoa to Hawaii, on one of the dives we saw um, an asteroid over a crinoid presumably feeding on it and Chris Ma had noted at the time that it was uh, one of the very rare times that he had seen an asteroid feeding on a crinoid. Right, that's that's the on, only the second uh, example of that that I've heard about and the first was that one in Antarctica. Interesting, thanks very much Scott. This is interesting right. geology right. here because yep. you see that um, the edge of the oh, sedimented area crops out as a thin crust 
and then you go down slope with much more irregular um, surface features, still very low relief, but um, a very distinct break in the um, in the substrate. Uh, I don't know what that is. That looks like a sponge. Maybe geodia. No, it's not geodia. It's too perforated, and it's got a big, big uh, oscule at the top. It looks like a glass sponge. But we've also got some really gorgeous oh. splendens. Sorry, yeah. go ahead, Scott. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to say that sponge almost looks like one of the ones that's on a stock, but it's been lowered into the sediment. I wonder if the stock grows later and propels that body upwards. That would be interesting. I don't really think that's the case, but... Look at those two, that pair of shrimp in this Iridogorgia. And so they would be Bathypalemonella, Palemonella, sorry, Bathypalemonella, Ceratipalma, and they would live um, in that colony perhaps for their entire lives. And that's likely a Notice mating that upper pair. One, uh, a purple color, so I wonder if that's a female carrying eggs. The eggs are often purple in color. Absolutely. Ooh, can we get a quick zoom on the larger of the shrimp, please? Yep, that's what that Rick looks like. Past. I think it was. We're looking at Come it underneath. In So it's a nice contrast, Chuck, to the uh, mycid, apopsid shrimp that we've been seeing today. Uh, these shrimp carry their eggs on the pleopods, which are the swimming legs of the abdomen, whereas the mycid shrimp, the possum shrimp, as well as the amphipods and isopods, all carry their embryos uh, below their thorax in a, in a pouch. Right. Scott, are there usually differences in the sizes of the sexes of these commensals? So, for instance... Uh, good question, Diva. I'm, I am not sure. I'm not an expert in anymore, uh, technology. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but just then we got a great shot That's of cool. the of exactly as you said it, purple eggs attached to pleopods. Good spot, Scott. Okay, pilot, thank you very much. If we could continue on. It's an interesting question that uh, biologists, deep sea biologists, continue to try to address for a variety of deep sea animals, and that is whether there's seasonality in reproduction. And I'm saying it only because we've seen several of the mice swimming carrying eggs, and now here's this shrimp female carrying eggs. And so you wonder, is that just chance that we're seeing these, or is it timed somehow to uh, the input of food through the year, and now they've got enough that they can uh, produce a clutch? Yeah, definitely. And some more of these um, primnoid whip corals. Perhaps Canadella? No? Can we get a quick zoom, please, on the uh, single white whip? Go ahead, Bridge. Go ahead, Bridge. Move complete. Move complete. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. They look really. Be if All right, right like move. Just completed. Wow, should I take that personally? <laughs> I think we may need to come around. Yeah, you're going to come around. Yeah, now as we're going in, I can hey, see the hey, polyps hey, coming hey, out in hey, whirl, hey, pointed hey. downwards. Good call. Good call. Scott, she's very, <laughs> very good. No, it just looked a little bit more like a pipe cleaner. You know, the bristling, mm -hmm. the polyps were a lot denser yeah. than you would see them on a isidid. Here you can see there's more of those rings. So there's many more scales going from the base to the tentacles than that branched one we were looking at, which suggests that those were differently different genera. So this one's probably Candidella, the other one was probably Norella. Plus, Scott, we can totally blame the very expensive screen we're looking at. You know, we have a better, better view. That's, that's very nice of you to say. Thank <laughs> you. You don't have to let me off the hook that easy. Well, to uh, quote a certain uh, 1940s, 50s uh, film noir star, uh, with reference to uh, Diva's ability to observe here, or, oh, you know, you're good. You're <laughs> very good. <gasps> okay, Violet, if we could move on, please.
Yeah, come on out, video. Okay. We gotta move. We can't stay down here. Yeah. Okay. Are those more corallium down below? Yes, yeah, so I I'm think we're looking at some corallium, some more of that pernoid, uh, um, whip, and then some of the really large forayed sponges in the distance. But we can really see here, you know, the. Watch these. This is your navigator. Uh, just letting you know. Huge abundance have, uh, of animals minutes, on three this zero minutes left on hard bottom. substrate right here on the edge okay, I'm get back of on this heading, huh? escarpment top. And if you look at the. Um, if you look at the Sirius camera uh, down, looking down on D2, you can see how that uh, the edge projects um, right in front of us, and uh, these organisms are taking advantage of that locality. Okay, now this one must be a bad Okay, we're going to have to turn more to one the... Six so, let's nope. see, yes. Uh, whatever the contours say. Okay. I got contours at... Maybe 170, let's see. You are correct. Would you say Lepidisis? Uh, 160. Or 160. Some of the... I got contours at, but... Well, um, you know, technically right now, anything that is a... You know, <laughs> which all these families are seeing, are... That is Does that sound good, Josh? 160? Informally in the genus Lepidisis, uh, so that's okay. always... In I'm on Great. 160 you, now, and the we're choice. still not perpendicular to this thing. Okay, so we go more starboard. Yeah, uh, okay. Stand so high, let me come around some more. There's a another, fish mid screen right, right now. Go ahead. But that's good, so now we know that here. And south, is the, uh, can you focus pilot or video uh, before we leave on the one directly behind there? The, well, that's uh, Corallium, yeah, I would and say the one south. above it. 180i. Is, that's not Corallium, is it? The one above, but yeah, yeah, right there with the thin branches. Yeah. Um, I, I'm thinking that I don't see anything up there. We could probably of, uh, do 30. Okay. And that, Go ahead, in. Uh, it's not in focus yet, but maybe that is Candidella. Pretty okay, thank enough. you very much. ROV so not a bridge. Go right ahead. Yeah, we'd like to move uh, three zero forward. meters. Yes, uh, bearing yes. one eight zero degrees, speed decimal two. Yeah, so yeah. that's where the there are polychaete worms. Bridge they're copy. Genus Gorgonia polynoe. So they're scaling. Three zero worms. meters. And they live in one eight zero. With, uh, speed decimal two knots. Here Good copy. Stand by for input. Uh, Candidella imbricata is the name of the coral species. And the presence of the worm induces the coral to deposit its sclerites, those microscopic calcareous elements, in a pattern that forms a little kind of tunnel or a little garage. And yeah, the polychaetes walk, live yeah. in there. And there may be See? hundreds of polychaetes living on a That's single all. colony. And we don't believe they're feeding on the coral, but they're using the coral as a home. And uh, that's one of the ways it's easy to recognize them because of the... Bridge, ROV, little, NAV. Go ahead, bridge. Uh, ROV, NAV, bridge. <laughs> that is a move initiated. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's, that's a great zero. observation. I had no idea. And then you can see them all over there, just one after the other. Head south. So we're trying to get a closer look, Scott. So because they're not actually eating the coral, but they may be harming it by burrowing into it, does that mean they're parasitic? Yeah, good question. So I don't know that they're actually burrowing into it. I guess they must be at some extent because the there is tissue laid over. I know it's right in the center. I think I see a little bit of blue. I wonder if that's one of the worms. Just... Uh, just to the right of center, kind of pointing downwards. At yeah, the and it looks like there are two little tentacles or something at the end of them. So just a bit cool. up, Josh. Um, there's like a right. So right smack in the middle of the screen. There, well, just to the right now. Up and going off to the bottom. There's a whitey blue area. I mean, it's not really blue. It's more white. With a little point on with the a, end? Yeah, or? with a little point on the end. Right, yeah. Uh, DVT, your question. At a minimum, these worms are causing the coral to expend more energy to grow because they're putting down these basically aberrant sclerites. But as you can see, it doesn't seem to have any impact on the growth of the polyps themselves. They're growing right over those little tunnels. That's very cool. Very, very interesting. Cool. I had no idea <laughs> that happened. No, nope, no. Nope. Yeah. We see this association a lot. Um, Tim Shank's lab up at Huey has 
uh, collected the worms, we've collected the corals to try to see is there any relationship between the worm species and the coral species and then the populations themselves. And, um, you know, there's also interesting questions about how do the larvae of these worms find new colonies of the coral? All kinds of interesting questions that are generated by observations like this. Thank you very much, Scott. That was extremely interesting. Thank you. All because I wanted to look at a bamboo coral. <laughs> so you may have just heard, we have 30 minutes left on the seafloor for this benthic portion of the dive. Here at Incised Escarpment Ridge, we are at a depth at 1875 meters, 1875 meters. And I think we're going to continue a little bit more upslope. Um, it may be sedimented, but just so we can get a little bit more of a feel for what type of geology um, and habitats there are. I don't know what it was either. Further up. It looked sort of like it was swimming like a shrimp. Yeah. After does, that, our dive is not really over. Tail, we are going to take half an hour it, huh? to zoom up into the water column to one kilometer depth, where we should be starting midwater transects 10 minutes per depth. And we'll be doing six steps, and that is to explore the least known habitat on our planet, the midwater. Yesterday, I spoke about um, one of the earlier hypotheses about uh, the, the idea that life could not exist in the deep sea. And of course, life was discovered Fish. Uh, in the deep Fish. sea. Um, no, oh, there's a nice little, uh, oh, there's this tiny one. So that's definitely an Ophidiad. Okay. And that's probably only four inches long, if that. So um, with the expeditions leading up to the Challenger and thereafter, life was found down to, um, well, you know, many thousands of meters down. Yep. And uh, the final uh, coup de grace was uh, the Danish um, deep sea expedition aboard the Galathea in the um, uh, very end of the 1940s, early 1950s, which trawled the bottom of the Marianas Trench and other right. deep sea trenches in the Pacific and found living things all the way down to the greatest depths over about 10,000 meters down. Uh, that was fine for the bottom, um, of course, but in the uh, latter part of the 19th century, uh, after the Azoic Zone hypothesis had died because people found life in the deep sea, um, Alexander Agassi, who was a brilliant uh, marine biologist up at uh, Harvard, following in his father's footsteps, um, uh, supervised the deep water collections of the U.S. Fish Commission steamer Albatross, which made numerous cruises. And um, unfortunately, this is another example of serendipity. When um, Edward Forbes came to the conclusion that no life could exist in the deep sea, he did so because he was uh, dredging in the Aegean Sea, where the circulation in deep water is cut off. And indeed, oh, there's a, one of the carnivorous clatterized sponges. And you can see it's got the commensal polynoids living on it. About just above the left laser, you'll see a bluey stripe on the stalk of the clatterized. And yep, there you go. You can see it's beautiful little scales wrapped around that sponge. And we actually collected one of these on the first dive. Um, and it did come with two scale worms. And uh, so just to wrap up this quick story, Sorry. Um, Edward Forbes dredged in the Aegean Sea ROV Nav and bridge, uh, a complete move. circulation is cut Express. off from the rest of the Mediterranean in deep water. So there is little or no life, and, but he made a broader generalization. Well, Agassi, among uh, a bit, some decades later, was trawling in the midwaters off the Eastern Pacific and in the mid midwaters there, there is what we call an oxygen minimum layer. Um, as the uh, productivity, as the plankton um, of the upper waters 
uh, dies and sinks into deeper waters. Bacteria colonize the sinking detritus and use up the oxygen. That's one reason. And you end up with a zone of very low oxygen concentration. And of course, as a result, few larger organisms. So Agassiz took the tack that, OK, well, there's no life on the deep sea floor. But I believe, he said, that there is no life in the deep midwaters. Uh, of course, he was trawling in the wrong direction, in the wrong place. And the German Karl Kuhn, who uh, dredged and trawled in the midwaters, uh, trawled in the midwaters of the Southern Ocean, found life at all levels of, of the deep sea and uh, uh, documented the fact that life does exist at all levels of the deep sea. Of course, there are places where, because of lack of circulation and low oxygen levels, it, uh, you have little or no larger life. So you have to be careful where you look when you're um, answering questions, and uh, you have to be careful about generalizing a or from two limited left to swing down. data. Probably. Yeah, copy that. <clears throat> Did I hear him say something about collecting this? Possibly. Yeah, okay. So let's wait on the move then. Copy. And though this area we are on looks lifeless, relatively speaking, uh, except for the odd shrimp and sea cucumber, uh, there is a lot going on in the sediment. You can see all those little burrows and there is a great deal of uh, much smaller uh, life uh, in the one or two millimeter and smaller size range. And we just passed over another uh, Cynalacted Holothurian, perhaps from the genus Pseudostichmus or Mulpatiodiodemus or um, I definitely don't think it was one of the... Um, Olach lineus? Yeah, that one. Don't think it was one of that one, but perhaps one of the others. Oh, is this um, Achenella, Scott? You got my spidey sense up, I'm looking. This is a crisis. Uh, this I'll is check. a. You have good eyes if you can see that part. There's a nice little shrimp. So that was a negative on the collection. Well, it's certainly growing in the sediment, and I think I'm seeing nodes. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely yes, there, there are nodes. nodes. Well done, Chuck. Absolutely. Well, that's only because um, it's the only yeah. uh, bamboo coral I know that grows out of the sediment. Well, now you know, too, because we saw one earlier today, the whip lepidisis. Oh, the whip one. Yeah, this is the only bushy one that I know of. This is, uh, okay. are all of the chrysog oh, are all of these isidids um, bioluminescent? I know some of them, like this How's one, that? are. That's good. Um, we saw some right. of the bioluminescence on them uh, on a cruise some years ago. Do you know where you want to put this? Absolutely. So uh, I can't say all of them are. Most of them haven't been tested, but several so of them are. Up? Let me just say a couple of things about Aconelix. This is the first time we've seen this genus. Um, so one of the things I, got, uh, I was the told that there, full, yeah, uh, the branches there, are we have samples in all boxes. In the part outer. Dark protein spot. And they arise in uh, whorls, meaning that instead of just bifurcating in two, it can split into three or even four or five. Uh, where um, is that? Uh, yeah, where? Uh, my student has just written a paper on the Achenella of the North yeah. Atlantic and the taxonomy, and for a long time there were some three different species being misidentified. So do you want a snip species. of this, or do you want the whole thing? They're the same, and they have uh, a great deal of a flexibility. Snip? There's a nice view at the base there. You can see the thick base, and then it's split Come into three. That note. On but the other thing that you see uh, is how curving those branches are. Yeah, I'm so all of those are, uh, yeah starboard dinner. Starboard dinner, roger uh, that. Pink polyps. And I have to go back to her paper. She described a new species from uh, the Gulf of Mexico on the basis of a single specimen that was collected several years ago um, on another program. 
and we haven't seen it in situ. There's no images, but uh, she named it, um, I'm pretty sure it's the one in the Gulf, Scarlatti, because the, the polyp color was red. And see, these are quite pink, so I'm going to go and check to see what depth she collected that from. Is this something that would bear collecting, then? Yeah, exactly. That's why I want to find out, because there's only a single specimen known, and we don't have any in-situ video, so we don't know what it looks like in place. Hmm. And there was a little uh, uh, sort of armor-plated looking isopod curled around one of the branches. Oh, that uh, an amphipod just landed on one of the polyps and uh, the polyp curled up. I don't know whether it was eating the amphipod or not. Right in the middle of the screen there, a little out of focus, it's closed up. Oh, no, you can still see the amphipod crawling on it. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, I think. they want the whole Your thing. eyes are better than mine. Yeah, it's right there. And so I think it was just a reactive, oh, okay. you know. This um, Achenella, uh, another reason I recognized it, uh, because it's growing in the sediment, uh, we had dredged up some in the Bahamas years ago, and unlike the sponges that have a, uh, a uh, fine branching root system, this one has what look like um, uh, long, um, sort of flattened um, branches. Um, trying to think of a, a good analogy to describe okay. them that spread out go ahead and um, the in the sediment. There's right. another one of those there mycids. Beautiful little crustaceans, bright red eyes. So I would think uh, Scarlatti is described it's from uh, it's all the way up. in and Norfolk. Starboard Canyon. Inners, correct? The new yep, Starboard Inner, yeah. The from the Gulf is uh, Achenella aurelia and is named for uh, the gold color. And it's the uh, gold color of the nodes, which you were talking about yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the few Achenellas, at least in the North Atlantic, that has gold colored nodes. Wow. So is this something that you think is worth collecting, Scott? Yeah, I'd like to get a look at the, the nodes first, uh, just to see if they're that color. Otherwise, uh, we do have actually quite a few Achenellas. Oh, okay. From the they gold. are most certainly gold. They grow in soft sediment. You can actually get them in a trawl. Right. Okay. Well, the, uh, the nodes certainly look, uh, if not golden, certainly pale brownish. Okay, sold to the man on the phone. Okay. Clear. So, yes, collect or no? Sure. Yes, please. If yes. you have the time, to okay. fantastic. So, this will probably be the last thing we do um, for the benthic portion of the dive. Um, yep, we're done. Pilot, if you're happy to, we would like a snip of this coral, please. Um, we have about... It turns out that that's what it is. This uh, imaging and video will be really valuable because it'll be the only known uh, in situ video of this species. Did we get the waypoint? Yeah. That's wow. what we're here for uh, at 30. So we have just over 10 minutes left in the benthic portion of the dive at so Incise Escarpment minutes, Ridge. We are about bottom. to collect yes. our fifth what was the, uh, think? sample what was the setup for the day. for Midwater on the way up? Uh, Light bars. Uh, I think all the bio boxes. Uh, I th no, there should I be one free. I think it's the so uh, uh, we're port gonna do outer fig. We can confirm that. Hold on. All the way to 900. Then once we get, get to 900, we'll do a transect. You pull up a little okay. bit down. And then we'll do the slow yeah. 10 meter. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, seven. you could put it in with the crinoid. They're uh, not going to interfere with each other. Lasers are clear. With the sea lily which I think went into port inner. Nice sample, Josh. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yes, please. Yeah, so just a snip would be great. Um, we have a crinoid in the starboard inner. Starboard inner. So that would be great to put it with that because we obviously wouldn't confuse them. Please. Thank you. All right, go ahead in if you have any more.
so today we have collected um, a crinoid, which we think is a new record for the family um, in the West Fort Florida escarpment. And not only that, but in perhaps the entire Western Atlantic, um, uh, tropical Western Atlantic. Simple. We've also Max collected a piece of sponge by accident when we were collecting a corallid coral. So those are the precious Wait, corals. Sorry. sorry, go ahead, Scott. Dina, can I interrupt? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, this will be rooted, so if it gets to be scooped, uh, it might be too late. You want to take the whole oh, thing? Oh, you want to take it? in the sediment, so maybe you can stick the claw in the sediment. S sorry, Scott, the I must have misunderstood. Do you want the whole thing or just a piece? Sure, if that's possible. Okay. Yeah, we only have one fragment of one colony known. Did not realize that. Pilot, did you copy all that? Okay. Thank you very Please, much. Please, thank you. Full bar. Do we have time for another move? Uh, yeah, we can get one going, I guess. Yeah. Short one. I figured, yeah, you got him at 75. Yeah, let's do another one. What heading, John? Uh, same thing. 180 is good. Hi, guys. Job. If there's any interest, there's a bunch of specimens identified as Echinella in the collection of Texas A&M yeah, University. Yeah. Anybody interested, now. get in touch with me. Thanks, Mary. We'll be doing so. Bridge Harvey now. Scoop, and maybe we can see Go ahead, the, uh, uh, Yeah, we'd like to move the, uh, uh, two colony. zero meters. That's quite a, uh, zero degrees. Quite a Speed lot of sediment that, uh, that's come along with that. The sediment must be very High copy, position adhesive. Move, range two zero meters, bearing one eight zero. Speed or there's two. quite a copy. dense root structure that holds mm -hmm. it all in place. like the shrimp is coming along. That would be nice. ROV nav bridge. Go ahead. Move has been ahead, initiated, screen. range good. two zero meters, bearing one eight zero, speed decimal two. Move initiated, that's good copy. Thank you, bridge. Disruptive if I offer a comment here? No, well, clear. Good. 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 no, sample's done. Go for it. Excuse me. Oh, fantastic. Well, thanks for that collection. I just thought I would add a little uh, interesting bit of trivia. Just do a snap on so this. That, what we're hoping that is is Achinella aurelia. And as I said, it was uh, named by uh, my former graduate student, Esprit Hisan Sautier. And she also described in the same paper Achinella scarletti. And those were named after her twin daughters who were born while she was uh, writing her dissertation. And she just happened to name one Scarlet and one Aurelia, which mean red and gold. And she had one species that had red polyps and another that had gold nodes. So it all worked out. Wonderful. Can we get a snap zoom on that uh, sea star that's sitting out there by its lonesome? So Next this to is that, uh, what I don't know what that one is. So this is a hymenaster, I'm pretty okay. sure. Now that I've said I'm pretty sure, I'm not so sure. Uh, I don't know. It could be. Yeah, those hymenasters are they're, the most gelatinous of sea stars, I think. So they're also called slime stars, um, and they're pretty robust and puffy, generally. And they also come in great colors. I feel like I see some fish on the background I'll look it up let's do a snap here <laughs> partial you can see it's a uh, little adhesive tube feet the suckered tube feet yeah I'm pretty sure that is a hymenaster
Yep. Good call, I would say. And let's see which species is that. Thing that was on the seafloor below that red. Almost looks like a minuscule octopus. Thank you. That's great. carnivorous sponge. This one anchored in sediment as usual. So I am so excited to see that Akinella in the lab and check out those root structures. I've never seen a coral with roots, only sponges. That. So this looks I mean, like I a sea pen. Peeking out as it was uh, being collected. Is this a sea pen, Scott? Uh, it's in the right place. Got the right sort of shape. Stand by until it gets in. Right. Yes, it most certainly is. Uh, perhaps genus Spiniculina. I'll have to uh, check that out. So the sea pans, I've uh, heard you say a couple of times, uh, these are also octocorals. Um, it's one of the three major groups of octocorals. These ones are specialized in sediment. You see that the base of the colony like there is disappearing into eggs. a little hole. Yeah, definitely did. And uh, in that hole, it would have an inflatable bulb that is keeping it in place. And essentially, that red stalk that you see, that's one entire giant polyp that has a single axial rod extending down through it. And then all the other small polyps you're seeing are arising from the tissue of that one axial polyp. Um, so a little bit different construction than the other um, octocorals that we see. So I have a um, an epistemological yeah. question for you. All right. Um, all of the two other minutes members of the Octocorelia, so all of the Alcyonaceans, Shelf Carls, Gorgonians, etc., the ones we've seen, and now Heliopora, bridge. the Blue Denim Good, Coral Move of complete. the um, Move complete. Great. Pacific, Thanks. and Tubipora, the Organ Pipe Coral, they're all called corals. But nobody ever, uh, to my knowledge, uh, of course I don't study these directly, nobody ever calls these sea pens corals. I mean, they are within the Octocorelia. So, um, because I've been thinking of putting together a short video, um, an, uh, an outreach educational video explaining what exactly a coral is or is not, because the term covers a wide range of things, sort of like jellyfish. Um, and so I wondered, you know, should I yeah, say, I minute you know, and a half left. Basically, last, last minute, here we have yeah. a group called the octocorals because they have eight parts, but one of them we don't call a coral. Those are the sea pens. Yeah, I think you've uh, basically answered the question while asking it, and um, it's a reflection of the problem of the common name, right? So right. the common name coral has been applied to many different things, all of which have some kind of a skeleton or a hard skeleton but taxonomically or systematically, I suppose, and in terms of evolution, they aren't all related to one another. And so, uh, you know, the group of corals is a loose term of convenience. And I will note, if you don't have this, Chuck, I'll send this to you for that presentation, but the word coral was first coined for an octocoral, for uh, right. Corallium rubrum in the Mediterranean. Right, and the story I got, I mentioned it earlier, you may have been away, was supposedly, at least what I read, and correct me All if right. I'm wrong, Time to pack that in Greek mythology, after Perseus Happy cut that. off the 
head of Medusa and put it on the seashore, the blood day. of coming out of the Gorgon's head or out okay, of Medusa's so head turned the seaweed into fresh fig. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought it was in the the will, the tween trench. Ah, the tween trench. Like so it's yeah, so first hall here. Okay. Yep, gotcha. Be a little bit more common in this area. Let's see where we're But yeah, that's excellent, Chuck, and it kind of backs up that historically. That's one of the early known morals. Thanks very much. Yeah, there's a, it also looks like there's a little, um, um, well, there's a uh, Bathypaleomonella Bathy on that one. And I thought I saw a little crustacean down underneath there. And Maybe. The uh, I can't tell, or is, or is that a shrimp on a lower branch? Can't quite tell. I think I saw from the other angle the hermit crab. Okay. Oh yeah, yes, you're right, you're right. And there's a uh, trail made by one of those uh, sea cucumbers. And so here we all of a sudden started seeing Achenella and several colonies of it. And this gives you an idea that, well, it's possible that, um, and is this one different? Okay, all the swing arms are in. Boy, that looks like a different growth pattern for sure. Yeah, there's some variability in how they grow and when and how they branch. Okay. Let me just quickly say uh, about the sea pen. The reason that group is called sea pen and not coral is because I think they're originally described, the name was originally applied to the genus Panatula, which looks very much like a quill, you know, a, an old writing instrument. Right. It's got that sea pen name. So these are certainly older corals. Uh, you can see the branches, uh, older Achenella, pardon me. You can see the branches are much thicker. Um, and it looks like the nodes, well, they still kind of look bold. You know, what we're going to find here is Achenella aurelia, and then the other possibility, which is much more common and abundant and widespread, is Achenella arbuscula. Okay. It's hard to tell them apart from seeing details of the polyps themselves. And earlier today, also, Chuck, I had said to you the difference when you look at Achenella, note the very tips of the branches. There's a polyp balanced right on the tip. Remember I said there's a difference in the way they grow. Okay. Sometimes they have a polyp at the tip, and sometimes they don't. And it's a characteristic for Achenella that they have a polyp at the growing cool. end. Um, the uh, bamboo coral we collected the other day, I got a photograph of it, and I'll, I'll make sure you get it eventually at some point.